three. Hey guys, today we got Brothers Racing, RJ and Rusty. How you guys doing? How are you? Good. Good to see you guys, man. We've been talking about doing this for a couple weeks now. I'm starting to think it wasn't going to happen. Yeah, man. It's been great. Thanks for having us in. Appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Just uh, pull your mic up a little closer to your face there. That way we can hear you. you got gotcha. you? Yep. Good. Good. That one's sinking on you? Just yeah. turn that dial right there to the right. Yep. You were on it the first time. If you think you're going to strip it, go a little more. <laughs> there you go. There we go. No problem, man. Technical difficulties. I'm used to them. <laughs> But, uh, so what's going on, man? What's new? Not much, not much. You know, trying to put these boats together and get ready for the season if we ever have one. You know, looking at Point Pleasant um, and, uh, you know, I'm hearing stuff now, maybe Ocean City. I don't know if you know a little something about that. But, uh, you know, the problem we have is the sponsors that we've had are Jersey-based and... Um, with everything that's been happening and trying to get the boats together and whatnot, I'm worried that, you know, you go down Ocean City and we have a problem that we can't fix and then you miss Point Pleasant. Right. You know what I mean? Right. And then all the sponsors are like, what the heck? Right. You know, you told us this all about this Point Pleasant thing. Right. So, um, you know. I'm not, I'm not 100% sure. I know we've been kicking around um, replacing Cocoa Beach with Ocean City, right. which would be fantastic. I absolutely love that race. Have either of you guys ever been down there for that Oh, yeah, I've been down there to see it. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah that's just such a good time. It um, is. There's it this, is. It's a, such a cool area. I can't believe it hasn't caught on to, you know, even the National Six Race Series and, and all yeah, that. I don't know why they don't bring everything up. Why they don't bring more of the national stuff up here? Uh, I it's think, real racing. I mean, we actually have waves. Yeah. Well, and that, and I think a lot of people just enjoy going south. Most That's true. most of us are from up here, right? So it's fun to go south, and uh, I think that drives a lot of that. You know, the six race series being mostly you know down south. Um, we have the Michigan run with Michigan City, and um, it's just tough. I mean, it's there's nothing. There's no replacement for palm trees and sandy. Sandy beaches and umbrella drinks and no, there's really it's true. Not. It's hard, man. It's it's, it's hard. True. I can tell you it's down true. down at Inglewood, man. It's it's a really nice setup you got there. I sat at the bar for three days watching boats get dropped into the water, you know, right across the dock, and then you just walk a couple hundred yards and you're on the beach and you know you're watching them race a hundred yards offshore and then. In between races, you literally just walk right back across the street and start drinking again. There's Inglewood, I think. They didn't know it when they built it, but they built it for boat racing. Mm -hmm. right. it's, just, it's absolutely perfect. It I is mean, set up really, really well. It's tight. Everything's right there. Yeah, you know? it's tight, so you get that complaint from time to time that it's hard to get to the crane or it's hard to get to the fuel truck. But that's only because so many people love going there. Right. I mean, it's everybody loves it, so nobody misses it. I mean, 74 boats last year. Yeah. Yeah. That was the biggest race out of all of them, and it wasn't part of that six-race series. No, it was a good, it's a good setup, and, and, and there was a lot of boats last year. Yeah. Now, hopefully, what I'm hoping is Point Pleasant, being a, if that ends up being the first race, I'm hoping that everybody that's jonesing like the rest of us shows up yeah you know what i mean and you just have boats everywhere i would love that that I, would and be awesome this town i think really really needs it as well because yeah. we're over 50 years of racing in point pleasant and i think the last 10 to 15 of those were a little shy you know we, we either showed up with 20 boats or 55 60 boats it's it's crazy we need to get a real show back in point pleasant to remind these people how cool this really is i mean right. it's you know doing this podcast i've had a lot of people on that talk about the benihana like me and jeremy had a whole long conversation prior to our podcast about the benihana and we were looking through some old pictures and stuff and it, it is just so neat to to remind yourself of what this used to be oh and, yeah. and what it can still be oh, i mean it's pleasant used to be huge yeah and i'm thinking with so many people sitting home right now with all their you know stimulus money and unemployment money and there's got to be more boat racers that are ready to go now than ever right you know i mean there's no excuse you had enough time and uh, most of us were essential or in you know some form of right. essential and uh i think i think it'll be good man i really do i think I think you'll see the best turnout in a long time at the smaller race sites now. Yeah. You know, because a lot of guys are picking and choosing, you know, having fun just being home. You know, right. that's a lot of people are in a better headspace right now. I know I am. You know, I, by now, by this point in the season, we would have already run Sarasota. 
Right. Well, so, and what was Sarasota and Point Pleasant? Yeah. Right. Because Point Pleasant would have been you know, Lotto, June fourteenth, right? And Lotto. Right. And you know, so down. yeah, we would have well, been Cocoa Beach three been or run already, and 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 Ozarks, right? The Ozarks race. Yeah, Cocoa, Ozarks, Point, and Sarasota. We would have yeah. been four races deep already. Yeah. And I just with the amount of, you know, the increase in the boating community right now. I mean, it's. Everywhere you go, it's mobbed full of boats. And so, there's a lot of new boats out there. Yeah. There's a lot of new boats out there. A, lot. a couple of years ago, I mean, you'd always see boats out on the bay and whatnot, but it was, you know, older boats. Now you see a lot of new boats yeah. out there, you yeah. know, in the last couple of years. So I, could, I couldn't imagine not being here. You know, like if we were on the road every other week racing, I don't know what the line of customers would look like around this building. So... <laughs> Like we would go around the building. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And so I I think that for a lot of us, it was nice to be home and be able to focus on your business for once and kind of have some fun with the family and maybe make a family reunion or something that we're never able to make. So now I think everybody will be in such a better headspace and mindset that when race season finally rolls around, everybody's going to be ready to go. Yeah, I hope so. You know, and and like I said, if something comes up in between, maybe, uh, well, actually now, right, uh, Moorhead City is actually going to be before Point. I believe so. Right? Because yeah. Moorhead City is early in the month, and, and Point's now moved to the end of September. Yeah, I believe so. So Point I, really won't be the first race. No, I, I've, uh, I've been trying to nail down the schedule as it changes on us. Right, and, it's and it just, changes constantly. It's, yeah, man, it's, it's like it, 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 you got to watch the news. You know what? Like yeah. you see the, the numbers go up in Florida, you know a Florida race is going to get shut down. You right. you know you, it's crazy, and and I get so many calls. You know what are you guys doing? I, we're just doing what we can with what they give us. Right. You know it's I mean it's there's no science to it. It's all done. The races were ready to go. The money was there. And you we've know? already told all of our sponsorships too. We put a thing up on the uh, on the page and everything that any of our sponsors that gave money this year or and did anything for the boat this year, everything is going to roll over to next year. Whether or not they decide to re-sponsor next year or not, it's going to roll over. It, it, it's the only fair thing to do. You know, h- how many times I've called them and said, all right, Point is still on for, for, for June. You know, okay, it's been changed. Now it's August. Right, and they're like, "All right, you said, uh, yep, August. It should be August. No problem. All right, now it's September." <laughs> and they're like, well, "What's going on?" Well, you know, same things going on with boat races is going on everywhere else. You know yeah. what I mean? We're trying to get a season together, but yeah, you can only do what what the governor will let you do. Yeah, and you know? I was I was sure. You know, I was I was pretty much positive that Point was going to go for that August date, and uh, we got the call from you know from the NJPPC, who is our you know our um, Organizers here in Point Pleasant, and uh, and they had spoke to the mayor, and it just couldn't happen. Right. You know, it's just there's too much, too much logistically to take care of anymore with this virus. I mean, it's think about it. You can't even run a restaurant right now. Mm-hmm. Right. You can't. I mean, you. I. Th- we have a, a restaurant here locally in the parking lot of our marina, and uh, I watch them all the time. They're putting up specials and getting ready for the indoor dining to open up, and then like that. Yeah, it's which gone. was supposed to happen, what, today? Today. Right? It was yep. supposed to open today. And yep. he was just like, yeah, no, and sorry. They're, and Fooled they're planning you. for a big 4th of July, and they're planning for everything to go right. And then in literally a heartbeat, it disappears. And it's what you're dealing with all the way up the food chain. I think the good news, though, for some of these ones like you guys have here that are outside now, uh, supposedly today or tomorrow, he's supposed to sign another order that bumps up to 500 people or something, what you're right. allowed to have outside. So hopefully what a lot of these places will do is, you know, they'll just add more tables and chairs outside yeah. and they'll they'll bump their capacity up so yeah. that they can make money. Because, I mean, people don't get it. It's like there's only a certain amount of months where some of these places can make their money. Yeah, yeah I don't and know they, about and they count on it. I don't know about eating outside in uh, December. Um, yeah, in New right. Jersey. Yeah, right. it's not it's not a solution, you know. No. And I and I don't blame anybody. I don't claim to have all the answers or think that I could come up with a better solution. But there's got to be something better than what we're doing right now. There's got to be. There's, there's got to be. Well, you know of, what? Look, as far as I'm concerned, you know, listen, do whatever you want to do in Trenton. Let us go boat racing. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's, that's it. Just let us have one. And it's not. You know? And with boat racing, we, we had a plan even back when this was rampant. I mean, we, we had a plan that was ready to rock and roll. I mean, right. you know, you wouldn't have to talk or see any of us if you didn't want to. It was all going to be done prior. 
you know, the only obstacles we had were the necessary things like the driver's meeting, your physicals, stuff like that. But we had people that were ready and willing with a plan in place and we could have went. Mm -hmm. So now with the numbers basically flatlined or decreasing in most places, I mean, you know, you have like your situations like Arizona or Florida right. or, you know, where you're seeing an increase, but you have to wonder how much of that is related to an increase in testing. Well, that that's the thing, right? I mean, they're testing from what I understand, like five fold what they were testing before. Well, if you're doing that, right, the numbers are going to go up. Well, and especially if you're operating with the with the original mindset of most of these people were asymptomatic. Right. So, you know, of course you're going to be seeing an increase in numbers. These people never even knew they had it. Exactly. You know, and I just think that... I've also understood that they're, they're now taking, you know, the people that have had it, that have antibodies and whatnot. If you test positive, they're, they're you know, they're putting that into the numbers. Right. And, I mean, okay... That, we, that doesn't count as a spike. Yeah, if, you, know, you don't get got, to count twice. Right, exactly. <laughs> you know, My thing is how bad are people getting it currently as well. I mean, um, with most viruses, I'm no doctor, but you know, as time progresses, the, the virus gets weaker and weaker throughout time. So, right. you know, several, maybe two months ago, we had, what, three, 400 people dying a day. Now you have, say, 30 or 40. So at that point, it's like, well... Sadly, some people are going to die from it, but if you have more people catching it like a cold, but like you said, asymptomatic or only have certain symptoms, but they survive, it, it is what you it is. You can't count that in the numbers. Yeah. Right. You know what I mean? Like, well, and I think that there, there comes a time for the conversation, which is incredibly touchy, of what's you know, a necessary risk. Right. You know, at what, at what point do you call the ball and say, we have to get everything moving? Well, you know. and, 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 you know, it, look, it's a virus. There, you know, you don't eradicate viruses, right? So right. It, eventually we're going to have to live with it at some point. Now, look, nobody, nobody wants their grandparents or, you know, their parents to die from it. Nobody wants that. But at a certain point, what do you do? You, you know what I mean? It, at some point, everybody's going to get it. Or we're going to get some type of a vaccine. But if the vaccines are, are, are anywhere near as good as the flu vaccines we've right. got, where you get the vaccine and you still get the flu, right. you know, what, what good is it? I, so, I, you know, I, my just mom. Just race. <laughs> exactly. And, and, you know, we, we took it pretty serious. You know, I talk about it now, you know, with a much more relaxed position. But my mom had just beat breast cancer as this was coming out. And uh, so when they were talking about the immunocompromised, you know, that right. that is a big thing. You know, I mean, for us, it was huge. I mean, this place was shut down for three months. I mean, we closed the gates. You, you know, it was work by phone only. You had right. to call and, you know, we would do the work and leave it out back and you call with a yeah, number. We did, and, we did the same thing. Yeah. We did the same thing. You we did all leave everything outside. We pull it in, you know, do whatever we got to do. It goes back outside. We tried to work as far away from the customer is absolutely possible um, but in the grand scheme of things you know w with you and a little maybe a little different for us because you're actually getting into an aircraft but you're still now getting into what they were just in right so and, and we're not you know you're not going through and, and totally cleansing everything down right but you know it, Nobody that we know of got it, and if we did, then it wasn't that bad. Right. You, you know what I mean? But for some people, it's not. Right. You know. But like I said, nobody wants their parents or their no. grandparents or whatever to no. die. No. Nobody. But, nobody wants to see. But that. I do think that people are in a spot now, like us, where we did everything you asked us to do. Exactly. And and we're continuing to do everything you've asked us to do, but the nonsense has to stop. Right. You I know, agree. it's agree. let's just, you know, I, I get it. I get the, you know, the politicizing of, of this and that. And but let's just take a step back and reel this thing back in and take it for what it is right. and move forward. You well, know, it didn't have to. I don't think that it had to completely destroy economies the way that it the way that it did. No, you know, it, it really didn't. And and, you know, c could we have run races? Yeah. I mean, I completely agree with what you said. I mean, there could have been races run already. And, and that would have been great for the local shops. Right. And whatnot. that's another thing that I don't know that people completely realize that, you know, when you shut down these races, 
you're shutting down a lot of people that are going to be coming in to not just watch the boat races, but to use the shops and the stores and everything else. And it, it brings an influx of money. Yeah, for yeah. not a lot of money to buy into. Right. You know, but the thing is that you have to remember, too, is the promoters that put their names on these races and take all the risk, they, they were having a hard time selling this because... Yeah, sure, the racers are ready to go. The organization's ready to go. We're all ready. But what happens in a town like St. Clair, where their usual foot traffic in that town is probably under 1,000 people? Right. And then suddenly you have the boat race come, puts 100,000 people on that river, and now you have this giant spike Mm -hmm. in numbers. You know, it's... They're going to start pointing fingers. I mean, right, and it, 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 some of it's probably better off canceled because, you know, here's the other thing. Even if you went racing and it, nothing really happened, there's, there's going to be a spike, mm-hmm. right? The, the, you know, somebody's going to grab a hold of that and say, all these people were in one spot and there's going to be a spike. Yep. However, there's no spiking when you riot and loop. <laughs> well, so you know, it's it, 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 listen. I I completely agree. I think anybody with any common sense completely agrees. Right. But I think that the common sense is being left out of just about everything anymore. Yeah, it's true. So it's just you know we, we're going to do what we can do, and you know just keep trying to make a schedule out of this. You know right. we're gonna we feel horrible. It you looks know, like Point Pleasant. I mean, as far as I can see now, I mean it, it looks pretty good. Yeah. I mean, when you have when you have the mayor come out and say, "Look, we're doing this," and then there's an article written about it and everything else, yeah, you know, that, that that seems pretty. We got pretty so good. lucky. We got so lucky when we lost Mayor Reed. He was all about the boat race, and right. when when we lost him, there was a, a huge knot in all of our local stomachs here. And this guy's just been unbelievable. I mean, we didn't expect this at all. No. We have his full support. Anything we want to do, however we want to do it, as long as it fits the guidelines that he himself has to follow, we can do it. Yeah. So, and it's looking pretty good. Oh, I mean, he seems to be he seems to be really good. Um, you know, it, I, I saw a couple uh, videos that he posted about um, some of the protests and stuff that were going on and, and whatnot. And he doesn't see. He seems like he's not taking any guard. He's a no bullshit kind of exactly. guy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he's no bullshit. I tell and, you, he should run for governor. <laughs> yeah, I'd vote for him. I would too. I would. I, I like yeah. him a lot. And and uh, I think that. With that, uh, Moorhead City is going to be fantastic. Anybody that can make it there will appreciate it. Um, Jeff McCann, that's running that race, right. he's a longtime racer, and uh, he gets it. He knows what it needs to be, what needs to happen, and it's an awesome spot. And I, from what I understand, he's got like carte blanche down there. And the good thing about that one, right, is it's it's like it's it's in the bay, isn't it? Yeah, mostly. Right. It, yeah. It's because so it's not going well. It shouldn't be horrible water. No, it should be know? pretty good. You know, and we we have a good mix. See, we in 2019, a lot of us got a really tough impression of a lot of these places, having it been the first for most of us. Like it was the first I was in Michigan. City, it was the first I was in Cocoa Beach, right? Those are two races right there that in 2019 were lily ponds. That, if you rewind one year before that, was right. small craft advisory, right? So, you could potentially see a Cocoa Beach race with 10 footers, you could potentially see a Michigan City race with six, eight footers. Mm-hmm. I mean, you could there's some potential for some big water on the schedule, oh, so yeah. I mean, it's and nice we could to also have. see a Point Pleasant with uh, with flat calm. I never, never. <laughs> it's, I can guarantee you never. right now, anybody coming to Point Pleasant in September is gonna get some big water. Well, it's gonna happen. Thing. That was the other thing when I saw the move. Well, first of all, when we saw the move from June to August, I was, was telling my brother, I'm like, Point Pleasant in August. Ugh. You don't know what you're going to get. You don't know what you're going to get. Could be yep. either way. But then when it was moved to, to September, I'm like, yep. oh, it's going to be big water. There's going to be a, <laughs> it, there's going to be a nor'easter that comes through at some point. Yeah, I, I just I it's you can never just have a nice point pleasant day. Right. It's always crazy, right. you know. So I'm excited for that, and I think that it's good that we have races like Moorhead, like Fort Myers, that offer you a nice kind of enjoyable race course you know? right. so it's good you kind of got the best of both worlds still on schedule if we manage to replace coco with ocean city that's another phenomenal event that's not a ham and egg event event that's a a good tried and true event you right. know right. and so 
I'm and the confident. way that event's set up in the past has always been really good. Oh, because you got the hotels to. right there. Um, it just it's it always seems like a great setup. Well, you and know? you and most most guys know uh, Phil Hauk from Bull on the Beach by now, and yeah. uh, he is pretty much the driving force behind oh, the he? Ocean City race. Oh, yeah, okay. and uh, so he gets it. He's yeah. a racer. He knows where it has to be, how it has to be. And then, see, those always seem to be the best races. Yeah. Right? The yep. ones that are set up by racers. I was just talking with, uh, with Mark um, and uh, Henderson, and he asked me if, uh, if I wanted to uh, get involved with a Barnegat Bay race. Try right. To put a Barnegat Bay race together next year. I said, yeah, I mean, if I can help out, definitely. You know, that's, that's how we grew up. Right. You know, we grew up in Bayville in the summers, and, you know, you go out, you watch the races. We grew up in Cedar Creek watching the Garvey races, right. watching, you know, watching the Jersey skiffs and whatnot. No shit. Um, oh, yeah, it was, it, you know, that's that's what, you know, got us into it. And then and then when a close friend of the family, Artie Kohler, bought or built Fast Company, and, um, you know, we, we grew up, we, we were small when he built that boat. 80s, right? He got it in 87 or 88 was the first time in the water. Yeah, so, I mean, he was younger, but I couldn't I have been... I was, what, seven? You were like 10 or 12 10, or something. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> Small. But I remember, you know, uh, if you guys go out and you wax the deck, we'll take you for a ride. Right. You know what I mean? I so remember you, sliding right off the deck, yeah. too. Yeah. Washing the boat right you in the You know, because it'd be in the water there, and, you know, all the adults are up there, you know, partying or whatever. We're waxing the boat just to just to try to get that ride, you know. Right. And, um, and, you know, and we followed him all the way through, We you know, racing B-class and then racing C-class and Key West and the whole bit. Um, so, you know, we have that that racing background and then even after that you know we always have always followed it the problem always has been is the boats that we had would have been fine class six boats now class seven boats now but they weren't that wasn't available at the time right what were you going to run maybe class a if, if if i would have taken you know one of the boats that i built out in class a it was one point pleasant race and that would, <laughs> that would have been the end of the boat yep. you know what i mean you can't take a uh, a well, pleasure and, boat and and try to you know bring it out there and, and well and that's put it a, point pleasant and that was a hell of a person to latch on to i mean that's a the fast company boat there through shit probably 10 15 years yeah. was always dominant oh I mean, yeah, yeah. and that so you got a good education there on the and way then, in from good people right and then after a while i mean he let he let the boat sit for a while and then came back in uh oh, oh nine was it oh nine it was that i thought it was oh one no oh, nine. oh was it oh nine? Oh, nine back to point pleasant beach and took first place with yep. with, with hartman's throttling yeah with gary yeah. yeah you know what i mean so i think bit, he would have taken first up in uh up in uh, Manhattan Bay or whatever before that race, but he ran out of fuel. Oh, yeah, oh, that's, were, right. that's right. That's yeah, right. He was running milling, first. He milling was running. too long, and he didn't have enough fuel in the right. boat. Yep, yep. Gary was, thought he was going to put the throttles through the dashboard. Trying, <laughs> trying to, they were coming around the last turn, and they, they ran that's out right. of fuel. That's right. The boat died on him. They couldn't figure out why. It was I wasted, they were out of gas. I wasted <laughs> a good Mercury starter on that exact reason. Did you? Yeah, oh, yeah. I ran out of gas from me to you to the finish line in Lake Apacon. Unfortunately. You just cranked it. Unfortunately, the tide was or the current was going the other way, <laughs> so we put it in gear and cranked it until we got across. <laughs> <laughs> you do what you got to do. Uh, D D loved reminding me of that. Whenever she has a checkered flag in her hand, she waves it in front of me, fishes me along. But uh, I wanted to talk to you more about the your background here. They, you bought basically the same boat as Fast Company. Basically, so so. We wanted to buy Fast Company in, in the worst way, um, but, you know, I don't know the inside dealings, but, you know, Artie had promised the boat to somebody else, I guess, through the years, a buddy of his or whatever, um, that uses it now for a pleasure boat. Um, and I think a little bit of it, you know, we're not, you know, almost 50-year-old adults to Artie. Right, and we're still those little those little kids that that he watched grow up. Right, and I think that part of it is like he just he didn't want us to get that boat, and then go out and have something happen 
and he would feel responsible. Right. You know, plus it was already offered to the other guy and whatnot. But we've had our eye on some boats for a while. You know, the, like I said, we had some boats in the past and, 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 and the classes never really lined up. Um, you know, and then marriage happens, right? And yeah. houses happen and kids happen. But now I'm at the point where where my son is just in that really cool age. You know, 11, he's going to be 12 in August. He's all about, you know, how can I help with the boat, Dad? And, and, and you know, we, we told him this year that, um, that because he was so young, that Schmitty wasn't going to let him be on the team unless he proved with honor roll that he had the maturity level because he didn't have the age well we got to put that in a rule book right yeah. and um and man he like he took that to town and 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 he's you know he, he we, we have him in a in, in a in a catholic school so it's not an easy right thing he's working for it and uh, yeah i mean the last semester with the covid right a little uh, easier. was probably a little bit of a gimme <laughs> right? right but um but he did he worked his tail off you know so that he could be a part of right. it and you know and now we have the money and you know and, and my nephews they're they're getting a little older you know right. so um you know it was time to do something and i think it was maybe his your birthday last year like maybe like around it was after the fourth of july and we we're sitting down the shore and and uh, and I, I remember him saying to me you know I, I, I'm, I'm going to buy Imagine that. Oh no, that was it was. I had it before the Fourth of July. Oh, you had it before. Oh, you're talking Memorial Day. Oh, maybe it was Memorial, Memorial Day, Day then. And um, and of course, his wife is saying he's not buying any boat. <laughs> and then he starts. He's sitting down with me, and um, you know they're not they're not around. And he's like, you know, I'm getting this boat, but you know he he didn't have the guy was selling it and he didn't have all the money and he had, he had his eye on it for a while so he was talking about possibly borrowing some money from a friend but we were getting into what was involved in that and i was like no you can't do that if you, you're gonna buy a boat you have to buy a boat i said if you really want to buy the boat i'll loan you the money but it's a loan this isn't like a my brother gave me money and i can forget about it kind <laughs> well, of thing. you didn't want to give me half the money you for know? free so um so his wife comes back in and we're talking about it and she's like i told you he's not i said no listen you don't understand i've known him his entire life he's buying a boat it's just how he's paying for it is a different story but he's buying a boat it's like th that's already been yeah he's got that in his head um, so More like I'm getting a boat. Right. Who's buying the boat? <laughs> is the story. So you know, we went and you know we looked at the looked at the boat and whatnot. He ended up buying it, and on the ride back to the to the house, because you know he bought the boat. It was in the water, so we we took it for a ride back to the house. And um, like halfway back, he was like, "You want to run it a little bit?" So yeah, I hadn't run a boat in ten years. Right. Right. So. I got in there and started running the boat, and I was just like, "Oh, we got to race this boat." Yeah, well, we got to race this boat. There's right? something about that. Right? There's a, I, I don't care who you are, from what walk of life, from what you do for a day job. It doesn't matter when you get in a race boat or a boat that needs to be a race boat. Yeah. There's, right. a, there's a lot of those too. And and this was an all-out race boat, right? right. It was you a race it. boat that they just put a back seat in so they could call it a pleasure boat. Right. But in no cabin. Right. You know, it, it's 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 just all bulkheaded out. It, it's right. a race boat. Yeah. There's um, nothing like a machine that was made to race. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, when exactly. you, you, you can get in, you know, I've been in, in some friends, you know, cigarettes or Apaches or which are all phenomenal boats. But, but it's not the same. It's, it's not, not the same. It's just it's not when you're in the bolster and you're ready to rock and roll and your helmet's on, your jacket's on, there's other boats around you, and you smell the race gas, you start to kind of change, right? right? Like right. none of us are really the same in the parking lot as we are in the boat, you and know? They don't, they don't, they're not the same, right? Like you can get into a big cigarette or an Outer Limits or something like that. And yeah, I mean, they're great boats. These poker run boats and stuff, they're fast. It doesn't have the throttle response. It right. just it, it, it it's just, it's just a different boat. Well, it, it's a it's just a different feel. And the attention to detail. 
you know that you know to get in something and, and go 160 miles an hour from Point Pleasant to Atlantic City. That's cool. I'm not taking it oh, away no. from you. No, yeah, I'm it's not. Super I, cool. I hang out with a, a, quite a few of the Poker Run guys. You know, and, and I I enjoy the shit out of what they do, but it's different. It is. It's different. You pull it out, you clean the bottom, you get it waxed up so it looks pretty for the pictures. And it's meanwhile, we're at home sanding the strakes back straight. We're getting right. them all sharpened up. And, you know, it's it's just a different animal, you right. know. And, and all the race boats only look good from four feet away. Of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can get up close to it. It's like, yep. wow. Well, that's going to be the nice thing with social distancing. Everybody's going to think we got nice shit. That's right. <laughs> so, four, your boat might look good at four feet away. Most of the ones I see is more about 25. Yeah, yeah, well, we're not I, quite there yet. If it was up to Murphy, we would be. That's right, right. Um, you know, so on the way back, I'm like, we got, we got, we have to race this boat. So he was back and forth on it. You know, he's like, all right, I'm going to race, I'm going to race, I'm going to race. And then, um, and then we started doing stuff to the boat, and it was like, I don't know, I don't know that we're going to be able to race this boat. Like, uh, not this year, maybe not next year. You, you know, um, so I may or may not have had my eye on a couple Sutfins because right. you know, with the fast company and everything, you know, big, always been big on the Sutfins. So I had my eye on uh, the outrageous that uh, that Mike Melo had, Mello? Mello. Mike Mello had for a while, um, and um, uh, TKO, the Walter. smaller one, right. not the big black one, but the, the smaller, the white boat. Right. Uh, I know that, that boat very well. Yeah. And we, that uh, boat supposedly was never actually for sale. No, I don't. Yeah. Think, I don't think it was. I, they they put it for sale, but I think it went back to the original owner. Is it still Walters? I don't know who has it. All I know we, is I looked into getting it. And it was just a big circle, and then yeah, someone had told me that like, it was it listed was for sale. But, but try to buy it. If Walter, you know? if Walter still owned it, I could understand. We actually, this the Viper raced that boat in particular a, a number of times, and it was one of the only ones over the years that would turn with this one. Right. And uh, it, it, unbelievable, that little stuff in oh, ran. Yeah. I mean, ran, ran. It, it did. It yeah, did. it was a and monster. I was really, really, really interested in that boat, but. You know, I mean, you can be interested all you want. If you can't, yeah. you can't buy it. You can't buy it. Um, and then I was, I've been, I was watching Tsunami for a while. But the thing that had me on Tsunami was it. It hadn't raced in a while, and and I had no background on what it was doing. Like it, all these other boats, you can like go on YouTube and you can like see them running around. Right. But Tsunami, like the last videos were on there was like after they uh, completely re-rigged it and they, they, they put the EFI 500s in it, which was years ago. Right. Um, which would have been Lizzo? Uh, no, that was, um, well, the Bradleys had it completely re-rigged right. by Richie right. um, so that they could run factory class. And then it got sold because, um, you know, I'm, I've been talking with Rob a lot, so... He sold it to somebody, and, and I don't know the name, but he sold it to someone who was supposed to race the boat with his wife, but something happened. Uh, one of them got cancer or something, and, okay. and, and it just it didn't it didn't happen. Right. So the boat sat for like six months, and then the Klitzes bought it, Dan Klitz, and um, uh, they went through and they pulled everything. They, they, you know, they pulled everything out of the boat, and had it powder coated, and you know all the all the stuff like freshened up on right. it. Um, they had the boat for a while, and then they. Th th this was the hard part, trying to find out where it went from there. Right. But it it was sold to a guy named named Dan, right, from Inland Marine mm -hmm. in Mass, and that's where I found the boat. And um, I'm a little jealous of Dan with his air conditioned shop on a 110 degree day. He did. We, when we went up to see the boat, he's got this little. This, uh, it's not little. It's not it's little, a, but it's a, yeah, shop. a smaller shop. And that place must have been 60 degrees. Right. And it was, when it was we about 105 degrees I'm outside. Like, right. I'm like, man, that is this nice. Is nice. Right. It is. So I, we tracked him down, and he didn't want to talk to anybody. There was this guy, Adam, who's a, a, a broker. And so I called Adam, and Adam's like, yeah, you know, the boat's for sale, kind of, but it's not. So he talked to him, and Dan's like, yeah, I don't, I don't want to sell it because it's got, it's got a bad motor. So he called me up, and he goes, it's not for sale. It's got a bad motor. I'm like, so? Right. Everything's for sale. It's for got a, it's, it's right. got, I don't care that it's got a bad motor. 
Uh, you don't care if it's got a, no, I don't care if it's got a bad motor. I'm going to go through everything and freshen it up anyway. So we ended up, he ended up talking to him and the guy's like, all right, I'll sell it. If they're all right with the bad motor, I'll sell it. So um, basically what I, what we thought we were getting was a turnkey boat with one motor that probably needed bearings. You, you know what I mean? Uh, what ended up happening on the four, you know, the 496 has the, the pressed on um, uh, belt balancer. Uh, balancer. Right. Well, it, it loosened up somehow, came off. They never so keyed they, them. So they, it never, was never keyed. It was just right. pressed on. I think that's the way Merck did it. Some of them, and, yeah. Right. Um, so it came off. Well, being that we have, you know, a, a, uh, a an external oil pump, right? That it, when when that came off, he lost everything. Right. And yeah, of course, everybody's story is we shut it right down. Right, <laughs> shut it down. But um, did, right did, when it stopped running, right, shut right. Down. Everybody <laughs> shut it down when it stopped running. Um, so you know, I knew that it needed, and and it did. I mean, when we pulled the engine apart, the the, the bottom of the oil pan, it was, it was confetti. <laughs> the, the bearings actually separated. The, the, the tri metal bearings physically were. Confetti, right. Confetti. <laughs> little piece. I was like, yeah, he shut the. They I'll literally the pulled apart <laughs> and was confetti. In, in, I'm, in the I'm at the machine shop and I'm going through the motor and I'm just throwing stuff. I'm like, did this guy shut this thing down? I'm like, yeah. The crank, I, I, the crank was yeah. bent. Yeah, I'm, uh, the crank was you bent. Know? I had to heat up, you know, so, heat the crank up. We had to straighten it back out. And I'm sitting there every day telling him I'm at the shop. I'm calling him and I'm like, in the meantime, Dude, this guy shut this thing down at about eight thousand RPM uh, <laughs> with no oil pressures when he shut it down. And of course, I'm like, you know, well, it is what it is, right? We're building a motor, so is what it is. In the meantime, we started the other one, and we started up, and he's on the ground going, shut it down, shut it down. So I turn it off, and he, you didn't hear that? I'm like, no. He goes, how did you not hear? It was knocking like crazy. <laughs> I didn't hear it, you know what I mean? Where I was, I couldn't hear right. it. So we end up pulling both out. Now, fortunately, these guys built me unbelievable motors right we, we we completely built them from the bottom up we took the original motor that was the brainchild of matt hayes who built them uh he did along uh, with uh um uh windsor uh windsor uh, automotive um, uh, paul what's paul, his last name rock paul rock from windsor paul, automotive yeah, he um i i go i very close with paul um when I used to drag race, I build all my engines. We do all the machining, actually, too. Right. Um, to the point that dynoing everything, I go in there, I can mill everything, machine everything, well, that's awesome. assemble everything. So um, I get to use his tools. Hey, well, shout and, out and, to Paul Rock. Yeah, that's yeah, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so and, uh, we, son Dan. So. We, uh, we built them from the ground up. I mean, we took the original idea that Matt had originally built for the, for, for the, for the boat and, um, you know, and then put a little... Apex Marine Racing Engine twist on it here and a little something there. Um, so they built excellent motors. Now what it comes down to, it comes down to me because I got to figure out how to how to tune these things. Right. You know, and and it's been a nightmare. You know, trying to figure out where I need my fuel, where I need my timing, what to do with these blowers. Right. You know, because it's not. You know, you you can call Whipple, and and get a map for a four ninety six, but. When you change everything in the motor and you yeah. got different stroke, different pistons, different everything, you know it, it changes everything. We deal with that all the time. It's yeah. never the same. No. It doesn't matter. You could build ten of the same motor right in a row, right. and they all want something different. Right. You know. Yeah. It's, 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 he keeps saying that the, we'll call them four ninety sixes, but the only thing four ninety six on that's the metric bolts and the um, <laughs> the block that. Uh, Which is fun too. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Trying to build these 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 motors where everything's metric on them. Yeah. You know, trying to get the bolts and everything like that. So we end up building them up because and, and really the tsunami came out of not thinking imagine you know that imagine that would be able to come together fast enough. Right. You know, so we bought a boat that we thought would we could get together quicker. Turns out I was wrong. <laughs> yeah, it turns out his boat, my boat, just an hour here, an hour there, has gone together way faster than his boat with OB Care a month there. Right. And, you know, but this is just... Tsunami will be done first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, that, that, that's where we've been, you know, a year. Right. Trying to, and you know all about that. It's a big you know, task. It's, it it, you know, a lot, you know, it's one thing when you're starting with a boat that has all the holes in it already. 
yeah. you know, it's it's another thing when you start to re-rig and change things, and you know, you're not just bolting shit back together. Well, and that's the whole thing, right? The, you know, it, it, the tsunami probably would have come back together a lot faster if we left it the way that it was, right. but we didn't, right? We, right. Did, you, you know, you, you change one thing, you put a drive guardian on it, now you can't use the same drive shaft. Now you got to get that Imco extent, you know what I mean? Right. Because we had, you know, we had the drive shafts in there, it was coupled right to the... Um, to the bell housing. Right, right, right to the bell housing. Uh, we had to make so, all new motor plates. So we all that has to go away, and re- you know? Right, right. Everything and then because, the motor plates have to go, because with those other shafts, it was lined up good enough for those shafts. Right. It wasn't lined up good enough nope. for that long Imco shaft yeah. to try to make it into that they don't drive like, guardian. They don't like the bend. Yeah, he, he, he <laughs> put it in and goes to slide it in, and he's like, how close is it? I'm like, uh, it might go in the other motor. <laughs> so then, then we end up pulling the motors, and I have to you know, fabricate all the motor, motor mounts and everything. You know, it was just one thing after another. But it's, it, it's almost there, and we're getting ready to wet test it. Uh, maybe tomorrow right. we'll see so um, you know we got our fingers crossed and um, you know we want to get it out for the next race now we were thinking the next race was going to be point and a lot of our sponsors are you know they were based on the fact that we we're going to race in New Jersey um, so if something else comes down the line beforehand it's going to be a hard decision for us because we don't want to take a boat somewhere and have something you have you know we just built it have right. something happen that we can't fix and then let everybody down if we can't run point well the cool thing the cool thing about what you're doing here is there's not much that we can't fix and right. and here's and, and i know how that sounds but it is really it is true you know like say you went down to ocean city and heard something there's not much that the community collectively can't help you out with. Right. And, and it, it just seems to always work that way. You know, you'll be at the awards, and what happened? Oh, I blew a drive. I got one. Come by the shop when we get back. You know, it's, it's, it always works that way, where we can usually get you back out on the course in a week or two. You know, there's yeah, that's good. a lot of us that are willing to help. I mean, it is. And hopefully, maybe by coming on here and, and you know, getting to Point Pleasant and, and maybe Ocean City, a couple of the other ones, you'll get to know a lot of you know the teams and the guys around this whole thing they're more than willing to help right. you know and and there's a lot of guys i mean i can't name names but like in particular the saracens right they they go they bend over backwards oh absolutely i mean i do i don't even really know johnny other than you know talking on facebook or whatever i i i sent him a pm and you know talking asking him about uh, setting some things up on the on the computer, like I like I was asking you about, and um, he was like, yeah, you know, he got back to me and he was like, you know, this is like a really busy time of the year, but you know what? Call me. I'm sure I can, you know, push 15, 20 minutes aside or something like that to help you out. Yep. This is a guy that I've never really talked to, really face to face. And you're about to race against. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. And he's about to be uh, yeah. our one of our biggest competitors. Yep. You know, and he had, you know, no issue. Um, I haven't been able to make the phone call yet, but I'm, you know, I may have to. But yeah. that was like, it was unbelievable of him. And, and, and we cannot be on the podcast, right, without talking about Mark Henderson, right, Jay. has been unbelievable. Jay Waltman. Unbelievable. The, I mean, Kyle, Kyle too. Kyle, even, even Kyle. Like, you know, anything that we, that any questions that we had. And, you know. Jumping into a class four, even though it's a bracket class, you know what I mean? Jumping into a class four race boat, it's expensive. Oh, yeah. And like everybody has said, you know, you have to play within within a budget. And, you know, on a class four race boat, you're talking about a six digit budget. Oh yeah. You, you know what I mean? To try to run that boat, especially when you're trying to put it together. Yeah. Well, I mean I um, thought I could do it for like thirty or forty thousand. Yeah. I didn't realize that that was like thirty or forty thousand after Well and it gets first, a little tough. You, you know. clear you clear class five there into class four and you suddenly are dealing with twin engine boats. Right. So immediately your cost doubles. Oh and so and I'm already thinking like I was talking to you about, I'm already thinking, look, let, let's say, let's say we get into class four and we do really well. What do we go to? Right. Right? And I keep telling him, whatever we go to, which will probably be Super V Light, and he's like, why? Because there's one engine. <laughs> right. Well, and one pretty bulletproof engine. Right. You know, that is a nice part. The, the spec classes do have a much bigger buy-in. I mean, that's just, it is what it is. It you is, know, yeah. it's, a, it's a, a, a bigger initial bite. But 
you're maintaining a pretty simple program. Right. You know, as long as you play by the rules. Well, Mercury made a hell of an engine when they came out with that 525. They, uh, they hit everything on the head. Yeah. I mean, it's just the, the 525 is, I wouldn't change anything. No. But the big question is, is why don't they want to make it anymore? Well, because I think they are. Um, the, the five, they make the 520, and then they make the performance version, which is, I believe, the 540. Right. And then from there, they make the 565. Yeah, I was going to say the And uh, the 565 is probably the most comparable of the three to the 525. It's definitely a whole lot more torque. It's got the bigger throttle bodies on it, so it breathes a little better up top. Um, but for all intents and purposes, it's the same idea as the 525. Right. So they're still somewhat making the 525. They're just a little more updated. I mean, if you think about it, how long has the 525 been out? 20 years? Well, yeah, right. 2000, 2000 2001, right? Yeah, I mean, something it, like that? Yeah. it's somewhere around 20 years. So it was time. It was time to come out with something else. Yeah, but now what do you do? Well, I what, think... What do you do in the spec class, right? I well, mean, does everybody go into a new motor? That's, you know, that's kind of the... the the hot button anymore we all tiptoe around that question because it starts too much drama between the two <laughs> classes but the truth is the two classes do need to and i i talk like you know everybody knows what i'm talking about there's there's two classes you have pro stock v and you have uh v uh v extreme i think they're called super v extreme or is that instigator super v and lily light. Extreme. There's Extreme V. I, I make my own name. Extreme V. I don't know. It's something like that. It, it, all the classes are posted on the OPA website. Mm -hmm. But you have basically 30 foot to 32 foot Phantoms or single to twin engine or single to twin step V bottoms in the in the Extreme class, which is the only difference is a carbureted motor. So it's basically the 525 with a carburetor. Right. And they, they were spending a whole lot more RPM and they changed about a year ago or two years ago. So now we actually turn the same RPMs. So it's just if you took the intake off a 525 and put a intake and carburetor on it, it's basically what they're running. So why can't we come up with some way to get even here? You know, well, they're they're going to right. What's going to end up happening is you're not going to be able to get the 525s anymore. You're not going to be able to have a sealed motor. I would right. imagine uh, you have to have a sealed motor right for the class. Yeah. Well, the rules now, as they stand, are that if you do any modification, repair. Um, simple maintenance, whatever, to where you broke one of those seals, it has to come here to be resealed. Okay. And uh, before we reseal it, we dyno it to make sure it makes the right baseline horsepower. And there's a, you know, a, a gray area there of, I think it's 10, 10 horse in either direction of the baseline. Um, and then we seal it with our own seals. So we've gotten around it. The problem is I've seen this too many times where... When you start to take a motor that made a whole lot of sense and you start to add things that make sense for certain people, right? it starts to kind of make it a little screwy where it's hard to trust that we all have the same motor, right? And we're not there yet. I think that's, that's years down the road. Where we are right now, we have a great group of guys in that class that I would trust with my life, let alone to cheat against me, you know? Right. Um, so I think we're okay right now, but it's coming. That time's coming where... Rebuilds are going to be ridiculous. You can't get these OEM parts anymore. You can't get this crank, these rods. You can't, and so now you're going to have to start working around it. Whereas if you just bite the bullet and decide on a new package, right, we're Everybody okay. It just goes right into well, that, and then you can pull all those boats together. Right, and the then the five twenty five performed so well for so many years that you could still buy you or you could still sell a five twenty five right now for ten to twenty thousand dollars, depending on the condition it's in. So. When you're considering what you could get for the motor that's in the boat, and if Mercury would come around and work with us on a new engine package to maybe make it a little more cost effective for 20 teams to switch to your motor, well, then we're in the ball game. Right. Right? Whereas maybe you didn't buy two new sets of wheels, you know, you saved that money and you bought the new engine, you know, and I think that that day's coming. And then you have a situation where Super V Lite looks a lot like Super Stock or Super Cat, where you're going out there with 16, 17 boats, you know, which, which is... Which would be awesome. That'd be unbelievable, man. Because it's, it's, to me, that's the blue collar Super Cat is, yeah, right. is Super V Lite. I mean, right, it's, it's true. It's, it's as far as most of us can afford to go. And, having, and it's not, that's not cheap either. No, Like it's everybody not. has to understand that when you start getting into that, it, it, it's not inexpensive. No. You know, and people are, all these guys that are doing it, do it because they love to do it. Oh, yeah. You know well, I mean? and you mentioned a few of them, um, Henderson and, and Jay Waltman. Yeah. Um, you know, Hendo, Mark's been around this forever. 
right? So if, if you want to talk to anybody, talk to Mark Henderson. I mean, he's probably the smartest guy in offshore. Maybe him and Ryan Beckley can have a debate. But uh, I talk to him all the time for, you know, a good point in the right direction. Or Waltman's another one who's been around as long as I have. And, uh, and he's been in and out of so many different boats. And if you talk to any of them, where they would like to end up is Super V Light. Right. You know, it really is. It's a great class. The boats run great. You're not running at speeds where you're worried about getting hurt or and it's still fun. But Waltman's there. I mean, they just have to finish the boat. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, they got it there. They're they're going through it. So. Well, Waltman's lucky. He, you know, he's able to jump into other stuff here and there. Right. You know, he's. There's a few guys that have made. You know, like a Jay Muller. Right. I think Muller has run every single boat. In the whole organization, right? I think at some at one point or another, he raced every boat. Well, and and, and Hartman too. Hartman, right? yeah. There's a lot Gary's of them. You know, I, I don't know if he's been in every boat, but, but he's I been would, in a lot of them. I would really like to see Waltman settle down with Kyle, get that green machine back out on the race course, because a lot of us miss it. You know, that's that that poor boat has been taken apart and put together more times than any boat I know. Yeah, it's. Um, <laughs> Not when I'm at the shop, I keep looking at it, and he's like, "Oh, we're gonna get it together." And I'm like, "Man, I hope you got a lot of guys." <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you know, like he says, he keeps saying, "You know, well, once you get on, it'll go together fast." <laughs> well, and what happens is, what you see there is how I called it the blue collar super cat, right? Mm -hmm. It's not. We're not talking about uh, we got to pay Sterling an extra thirty grand to give me these rings, or I got to you know do this or that you go home you take the boat apart and you find where you could save a little weight or yeah. you know where you could maybe fix a little spot on the bottom well, or look at pap right it's I all mean, about he's how reinventing the wheel yeah but it's all there. about how hard Literally, you want to work reinventing the wheel. Ser seriously yeah like yeah he's reinventing he's reinventing the whole helm yeah lowering it down in the bottom yeah. of the boat and all kinds of other stuff but, carbon fiber you know but some guys will look at steve and say why go through all that to gain a half a mile an hour Steve has gone through all that 50 times. That's why his boat's in the front. Right. It's all about how hard you want to work. You know, look at um, Britt Lilly. I don't think anybody outworks his team. No. I, you know, it's, it's, that's the cool part about Super V Light to me. It's not that your pocket's bigger than my pocket. It's who wants to work. Right. You know, and just the parts are all the same. And, and that's one thing Jay told me when I was telling him that he, my brother was looking into doing it next year or the year after. And he's like, testing, testing. He's like, you got to be out there every week testing yeah. that boat and moving things because he's like, if you're not testing, you're never going to win. No. No, oh, there's all kinds all of little things parts. you can do. When Jay was showing me this, um, you know, the, the tape on the side of the boat that will peel off as the race goes on so that you can get the air down in under the, ventilator uh, under the ventilators and, and what, um, I'm like, uh, like Seriously? <laughs> there's there's not much these guys haven't thought of. No, I mean, you know. they've thought of, like, pretty much everything to try yeah. to get the boat to perform the best it can when it's heavy, and then after you burn all fuel. Right. So, so it blew my mind even at Inglewood. Like I said, I, I'm sitting at the bar, and I'm watching them come over with sandbags and stuff. And, you know, they're over there, in I think it was Typhoon, and I'm watching them take sandbags, and they're just throwing them up in up into the bow of the boat and then all of a sudden he's like nope this is too much and I see him pull a half of one out and he's like dumping sand out yep. and I'm sitting there how much beer have I had to drink at this bar <laughs> <laughs> oh, are they putting sandbags in the boat yeah, yeah. I, right. I mean I know but like down to like I was waiting to see scales come out and then sit there and be like wait and you, got, you guys have to keep those boats within a certain weight to, right well pretty well over a minimum of I believe it's 40 40, uh, 200 pounds, 40, oh, so you can, 40, 250, you can go anywhere over it. You yeah, just anywhere can't, over you just it, just can't, can't go under. Yeah. It. So you can add all the weight you want. You just can't take the weight out. So right. when we crane in, your boat's completely empty. You know, there can't be any weight in the front. There can't be any water in the ballast tank. You know, it's, it's all that. Once it goes in and it's at the right weight and, you know, usually it'll be, say, I don't know, 45 pounds over, you know, because of the fuel. Right. Right. And then when you come in, you're usually right on that weight number you can add all you want so you could throw sandbags up in the front you could do any of that you just can't take away after you've weighed in i got you but uh it is it's super critical it is, it and, is. and even down to the wheel yep right it, it's even like it, jay wish they have a trailer filled with wheels right you know and he'll actually go out there watch the race before yep and decide right there what wheel they're going to put on the boat yep you know and because you just 
if you're off a little bit. The race is won and lost by one pitch. Right. That's it. I mean, it's set up. It's everything. That's why, like, I... And those I, wheels aren't cheap either. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> no, they're not. You know, and that's why, like, I laugh. You go on Powerboat Swap Shop, somebody puts up a five-blade hydromotive, click on the comments. It's all racers. It's all. It's the whole Super V light class right. arguing with each other over who's going to buy this one. You right. know, it's you know, and, and you don't even know if it's any good. Yeah, I was just going to say, right. but it might be. That's right. that's the gamble we take a lot. You know, look at I think Dante with the Showtime boat is still selling left hand herrings. You know, trying right. trying to get rid of them. Maybe just propsy try it. You know, and 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 and, and, and well, luckily if it's another racer, at least you know. But how many props are out there that? There's no props even for sale. No. I got roped into one of it. I tried to buy a pair of labbed props from a guy. It was a great price. There was never there was never any props. Right. It was all big scam. Right. You know what I mean? Luckily, we made out and, and we got our money back. But you know, you gotta you gotta be yeah. careful about that stuff too. Because if you try to go buy these lab props brand new, big money. Yeah, big money. Big and, money. and you can't trust everybody on that Facebook. No. <laughs> you know. But no, you can't. It is pretty funny, man. And, and I hope, I do hope that Super V Light comes together. But one class that is a hundred percent coming together is your class, right? So I, I wanted to to get back to that. You have probably one of the strongest bracket class classes of of the whole fleet this year. I mean, it's Inglewood. There was I think twelve class four boats total, which is more than we've ever seen. Yeah, that's a lot of boats. Um, we I don't think I've ever been around for. A ten boat class four star, you know, so that that's awesome to see. And now with the addition of you guys and a couple of other new teams like um, like Mark Robbins and and uh, I can't think of his Nate. name right now. Oh, wait. Nate yeah, with uh, yeah. with Predator, which he was running low profile before, but now with Predator coming in, I mean, you have a, a strong, consistent fleet in class four, which we haven't seen in a long time. Right. So I just I, you got to be excited for that. I mean, oh that, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, look, there's. What's if I wanted to go out and run in a circle against myself for a checkered flag, I could go buy a checkered flag and run around the bay in a circle. Right. Right? When you come out to race, you want to come out to race to race. Right. You could go to Key and, West and do the same too. Well, this is true. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't say that out um, That's all right. But uh, <laughs> uh, you know, it's great. You know what I mean? I know I know there was a lot there's a lot of talk going back and forth too. And we when when people first started finding out because you know, we ran under the radar for six months, eight months. No one really knew that there was these boats were coming back. But when people started finding out a little bit from looking at posts and whatnot, um, you start hearing people talking about, you know, Johnny and Jason and whatnot, and oh now they're gonna have and and you know stuff started going around and it's like that that's great right we want to race you know what i mean nobody wants anything for free right we, we want to go out there and we want to race let's go rail to rail and and let's do it and it seems like all the guys out there are a great bunch of guys well you know and what I mean? yeah and and you touched on johnny and jason there so i just had the smith brothers on so in my opinion you're dealing with the other set of consummate professionals there's you know there's a lot of us, it, my, myself included, I don't consider myself a professional. You know, like I, when I go to the awards, I'm usually still in the same T-shirt I was in the boat with. You know, <laughs> I, I probably got a cold beer and, and, you know, a half a buzz on. When you deal with guys like Johnny and Jason, Rich and Pete, the, I mean, there, there's a, a good group of those guys where it's all about that 45 minutes. Right. And, and it's why they're there. It's what they came for. And it's going to be the real deal when that green flag goes up. There's a lot of us out there that do that, but they're them in particular have one of the best track records of of just phenomenal performances. Oh yeah. So when you're building a boat like Tsunami, a boat like Imagine That, for a class, it's got to be cool to not only be building it for a class, but to go try to be a headhunter and go get the Saracens, go get Jim Simmons, go get right. Brian Williamson, go get these guys that for years now have been dominating that class. Oh, and that's the thing, right? You know, you look at it in, in our perspective and, and that's like, it's a big thing, man. You know, it's like you, you're, you're entering a class now where the guys that you're going to be racing against are what, three, after last year, what, four-time world champions? Yep. Right? Six. I'm, I'm sure Johnny and Jason have a handful. Yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's a lot. Simmons, so, Simmons on his own probably has half a dozen. Yeah, I mean you're in there with some right. real hardened and, and, veterans. And, and you don't. And, and it's not split. 
You know what I mean? It's not like a world championship here. A world. Cha- it's like you know. Yeah, yeah 15, 16, 17, right. 18. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yep. Right? You know, back to back. And, and, and then you start thinking about it and going, oh, man, it's going to be some racing. Well, and people and, like and they're to. Because I tell you what, guys like that, they're not going to feel bad for us and give us a check. No, that doesn't happen. Right? It's not going to happen. That doesn't happen. So, you, you know what I mean? If anybody. You're going to earn it. If anybody in boat racing has ever told that story, it's only because they don't want to admit that they lost. <laughs> Nobody gives anything away. You know, and. I think that there with, with that, those guys, that class in particular there where you're talking about a string of world championships, right? right. You've got to really think about what went into that. There's, everybody likes to interject with these you know, uh, circumstances, right? Oh, well, there was only three boats there in 2015. Okay, go five years of world championships and never break a drive. Right. Go five years of world championships and never have a lifter come apart. Yeah. It doesn't happen. You know, but for guys like Jason and, and you know, the, I mean, I, I get myself in trouble naming names literally all the time. But let's just talk about Jason there in particular, right, with Johnny. They don't break. No. They don't, I mean. They have that boat down, like they wear it yeah. when they get in it. You know what I mean? Um, and I, I would love to see that little box in front of Jason, because I guarantee you that thing is reading like, you know, 84.9 oh, yeah. the most most of the race. He's a machine. Yeah, it, it's crazy, yeah. you know, and they've got that thing dialed down to the point where they're wearing the, I, I've, you know, I don't want to go into this blind. So I've been watching, you know, you, you're, I'm watching, I'm watching them race. I'm watching what they do in the corners. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure these guys out and they're machines. Yeah. They're machines. If there is an opening next to that buoy, right, uh, um, they're, they're, they're going to come and they're going to take it yep. every single time. And, um, you know, and that's a lot for that. That's Johnny. Right. Yep. He's steering the boat. Well, so, and, and Johnny, to his credit, came up a lot like I did, where we he I think he actually was better off than I was when he went in into class five with the Avanti. See, I think going into the classes, the smaller classes, like now seven, but then six and five. You went into um, a shark tank where you thought you were getting into a 70-mile-an-hour boat, a 75-mile-an-hour boat, and you were put up against guys like like Warren Miller and Eddie Simmons and John Cohen and Mark Henderson and these guys who could clean your clock. Right. And so you learn in a trial-by-fire kind of scenario. So now you fast-forward to Johnny at this stage in his career in, in the Cobra where he's been through it all. You're not going to phase him. You're not going right. to get close to him and scare him. Right. You're not going to, you know, threaten to shut the door. Either no. do it or don't, because right. you ain't scaring me. No. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and, and he's the same way. So it's so to me, it's so cool for you. You're in a particular position here where you guys are going to go take on, in my opinion, the best there is. Yeah. You know, and so I just I'm, I'm elated at that for you guys and in the right boat. In the right. Well, and and that and that's the thing, right? That's the thing. Any more in even. In, Everybody says 85 mile an hour class, 85, but, but it's not 85 mile an hour class. That boat needs to do 85 miles an hour in five footers. Yep. You know what I mean? As so, easy as it does it in the lake. Right. Yeah. And, yep. and so you're not looking at 85 mile an hour boat. You're looking at a 95 to 100 mile an hour boat. Right. You know what I mean? To try to be able to do that consistently. Like you had said one time in one of the podcast, it's like, look, anybody can take their 85 or 90 mile an hour boat from Tyson Shoals and go running it down the bay and tell you how fast it is. Do it when you can't lift. Yeah, it's everything. You know what I mean? It changes and, everything. And that you're coming into a peg, you know, side by side, and one guy's got to take it. And I tell you what, those guys, those sirens, they're, they're machines. Right. You know what I mean? And they're not going to give it to you. No. You, you know, so it, it's it's going to be it's going to be a blast. It's it, awesome. It's going to be a blast. And it's, they got a great boat. You know, and that's one of the one of the reasons why I was looking at the subfins, right? Because when I saw them and what they can do with that boat, I'm like, I need a subfin, right? Because a subfin is going to be able to do that. In, I think the only chance that we have with the Saracens is if I can get them in water that my boat can handle a little bit better than theirs. They're, well, yeah. And their boat handles real good in all kinds of water. But there's going to be a lot to worry about on your way there. I mean, and that's that's see, this is why I absolutely love bracket class racing. People think 
that you know you watch the first couple episodes of the, of the show, right? And it's all bracket class, yeah. everything, right? I hardly talk about the spec class stuff, and I apologize for that. I know that the fans at home want to hear what's going on with Supercat. Want to hear the problem with that is who the fuck knows what's going on with Supercat? <laughs> who knows what's going on with Supercat? Especially Superstar? this year. Yeah, they do right? whatever they want. The bracket class guys. That's where the real racing is. That's where the real race teams are. That's where I mean, you get you get guys that knew what they were doing when Inglewood was over. Right. You know what I mean? You got a class that's dedicated to these ten races, not I can make these five or these six or we're gonna do a drop race or you're in you're in it for the real thing now. You know, you're you're in there with probably I would guess an average of six, seven boats at every single race this year in class four. Right. That's that would be my guess, right? So before you even get the opportunity to go take a swing at, at a guy like Jason or, or Johnny, you gotta beat a guy like Brian Williamson. True. Who's been running perdition on the rails trying to beat Jason and Johnny for years right. now. You got um, Mark Robbins coming out with his brand new 34. You got Nate Hunt coming with Predator that is locked yeah. and loaded. I tried to. I don't know if we're going to get him up here, though. I've been in contact with him. I'm like, Nate, He'll come, come on. Point Pleasant, Point Pleasant. He, ah, I, don't, I, I can't make it. He'll come. You He'll know? come. So Listen, hopefully he does. I'd love to see the that, boat come up. That boat in a, in a race like Point Pleasant, it's meant to be. Right. It's, he'll be here. In Apache and Rough Water, yeah, that, you never well, see that, right? And like <laughs> I said at the beginning of all this, too, is a lot of us are enjoying this downtime that we haven't had in a long time. Once the race season really kicks off, all these guys that are saying I can't make this one or can't make that one, you make it. You make it work. Right. I mean, they'll be there. I mean, I, I do that myself. I can't go to this one. I can't go to that one. I'm always there. And I think <laughs> I think that you know this year we have even a better chance too, right? Because there isn't going to be a bunch of races, so you don't get to pick and choose. You're you're going to have to go, if you want to race, you're going to have to go to whatever race is available. Right. You know what I mean? And and hopefully we can get that number expanded. But, yeah. you know, for right now, it is what it is. Well, and I think that the other really cool thing, it, it's not cool, but, it, I mean, it, nothing's cool about the situation we're in. I'm, I'm, I mean, we're all just heartbroken over the way this season went down, especially coming, at, coming off of last season. Right. So, I mean, it hurts. But we have a lot of really cool events down into two months. Right. Right? So this season is going to feel like craziness, even though it's not. Even though it's half the schedule, even though it's all packed into September to November, it's going to feel like a real race oh, season. It's going, when be, it, it's going to be a marathon. Yeah. Right? I mean, I don't think I'm ever going to get out of the truck. I think right. you just drive there and drive to the next race site. Well, that's the, other, that's the other thing that's worrisome, too. Like you said, what do you do with the customers? Right. You know what I mean? Because you got to take care of your customers. And the other uh, uh, aspect is, how do I race two races a month? For three months straight, yeah, with drive because you know, let's be honest, Florida is not next door, right? Right, and still take care of everything that needs to be taken care of. So, I mean, you know, we'll see. It's we, hard. We want, we want badly, and he doesn't think it's going to happen. But I mean, I mean, I hope, I hope that we can run tsunami in, you know, maybe Moorhead City. Maybe Ocean City if it happens. Definitely Point Pleasant. No, no doubt in my mind. But he, in the worst way, wants to have imagine that for the worlds. Right. In the worst way, and you know, I keep telling him, all we have to do, all all I want to do is finish Tsunami. Once Tsunami is done, I don't testing it. Whatever, we'll figure that out. But once Tsunami's done, we can spend all of the time. On imagine that, and just put it together. Oh, it'll come together. You know this, I mean? is, this is how you can tell he works on airplanes because they actually get done. Boats are never done. <laughs> <laughs> That's why he keeps going. As soon as my boat's done, we'll work on yours. I'm like, I should just sell my boat tomorrow because <laughs> well, you know, it'll never be done. Done, done to the point where you, you know it's tested. Well, and push hasn't come to shove yet. Right. We I mean, still runs. We still got some time. We're all the same. Right. <laughs> We're all the same. Right. Yeah, give it another month when Point Pleasant's just around the corner. Watch how fast stuff starts well, getting right. done. And, and Jeremy <laughs> said that, right? It's like, um, it's I got time. The, yeah. the boat's there, but I got time. And then a week before the race, you're like, <gasps> yeah. 
<laughs> it is. Oh man, I haven't touched it. What you thought was a year's worth of work, you do in three or four days. Right. <laughs> it's crazy. Well, I did that to him though, because he he was after me all winter, and he's like, "We got to get the boat started. We got to get it done. You know, we got it. It's in the shop." And I'm like, ah, "Your boat was already running, man. We just got to put a <laughs> no, we, we got, got plenty of time. That's in. all. That's all I heard. So that's I'm building. What? I'm building I, the motors, and I'm like, "All right, the motors will be done." And I dynoed them, and I'm like, "All right, they didn't come apart on the dyno." Um, so they're good in my book. Now you know right. Christmas comes and ah, we'll get there. Yep. And New Year's comes. Ah, no problem. Oh, I know no all problem. about it, man. <laughs> yeah, then I lower the motors in and nothing lines up. And yep. The shafts are off by an inch and a half and the drives are wrong. And, yep. you know, it's, it's always been, some kind of headache. It's been, <laughs> I mean, it, I tell you, it, it's, it's, it's been a learning curve. And this is coming from, you know, we don't not know what we're doing. You know what I mean? We've been running boats since, you know, we could, our parents bought, we, our first boat, I think he might have been five, five or six. And we had a 14 foot, um, you know, aluminum boat with a four horsepower motor on the back of it and whatnot. And then we moved up there and, and, and we got a, a 14 foot bay liner. You know, with a 50 horse on the back and whatnot. And we're out running that around at 14 years old. Right. You, you know, so we grew up with boats. We grew up working on them, fixing them and whatnot. And, but I tell you, this has been, it's yeah. a learning curve. But, yeah. but the, the joke of the whole situation about everything from the beginning was um, a, a very close friend of mine that'll probably drive, imagine that, at the Worlds, um, bought a 21 foot hustler. And he goes, we're going to run this race and I, I took it out with them and it was like november and i'm like dude th this isn't a race boat. i'm like what are you talking about he's like oh the opa there's this opa this is back what 2002 2003 it could have been five somewhere in there right and he's telling me my buddy steve he's like listen you know we're gonna race this thing and, and, and i take it out in the bay i'm like i'm gonna have no kidneys left you can't <laughs> race this thing with it he's got a 250 mark on the back he's like i'm telling you I that's think how Henderson I. Ended that's up how I boat. met Mark Henderson. Yeah. It wasn't he didn't buy it. It was his friend. He to comes, race it. He comes down right. to race <laughs> it, and, I, and they buy it. Get the money, and I'm looking at my buddy, and I'm like, dude, that thing's gonna sink in the first race. I do believe they're still racing that boat. Right I think now. they are. They've that been blue racing, hustler. The blue hustler that's blue and like a cream. That they're still racing it to this day out there. Um, One of Mark's buddies. And then I go out and buy a, a uh, 24 foot super boat. And uh, I built that. I'm like, I'm going to race this. And then everyone's looking at me like, you're going to die if you race this. I turned around and sold that. That would have been a good. <laughs> that would have been a. But that that would have been a good class. So, boat, so yeah. every time I build these boat. boats, I keep thinking in my head, I'm like, ah, it's just not really race worthy. And then someone buys it and races it. And I'm right. Like, I well, give up. imagine that is definitely a boat to race. Now, what is imagine that? So it's a uh, it's a, a Viper, a Tempest Viper. It's a Tempest Viper. It is a Tempest, 30, yeah. 32, te same, same as was up. Right. Yeah. Same boat. Same bottom. Um, so yes. Well, I think it's the same. Every, the, we, we've been back and forth about that. But I'm I don't know if... Imagine that may even have been in that same run of boats that your boat... Oh, no, your boat's older. It's older. Yeah, no. It's the Viper something. The Viper doesn't have a make attached to it. It's just a Viper. Right. Um, they're, they're the Tempest, the Viper, the Sutfin. Um, shit, there was a million of them that got copied there in a short short amount of time. But uh, they are two different boats, but the same bottom. Right. Um, so I do know that boat very well and how it runs. It's a fantastic boat. And uh, just to clarify, too, we went a, quite a while here without talking about it, but if you haven't put together so far, Tsunami's a 34 subfin. And uh, yeah, it is 34, a 30. 34 outrageous. Okay, yep. yeah, outrageous. So just so a little clarification there, that's two barnstormers for Class 4. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, well, uh, Fast Company was a 34. Now, it wasn't, he had the flat deck on it. It was an older boat. It was a flat, so it wasn't a, what they called, you know, the true outrageous. But um, where we have the step deck on Tsunami, um, but big, same hull. Right. Same, you know, the bottom end of the boat is exactly the same. And if you, if, if you talk to Richie Jr., um, the, the Viper is the same boat as the Sutfin, you know, three quarters of the way up. 
Right. And then the suction, you know, changes a little bit at the at, at, at the front of the boat. Right. Um, and but, I think that the only difference there is the lifting straights on the suction carry all the way to the deck, don't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah. Yep. They carry all the way up, and it's and and the suction is, is wider. It, it, it's wider up. It stays wider longer. Right. And then it kind of cuts in. Right. And that, uh, you know, that's supposedly for the rough water, right. for re-entering in the rough water to keep right. the nose up out. Um, where imagine that, you know, it, it stakes in real fast, right. which gives it a sleeker look. But I believe that's the other reason why. I, like again, I was, I think I was having a conversation with you on the phone about class four, class three. You know, not being able to run. I'd love to be able for us to be able to run both boats. Right. You know what I mean? But you can't. It's very difficult for two guys to run two boats in the same class right. at the same time. Um, My arms aren't that long. So, <laughs> you know, and everybody would say, well, step one boat up. I tell you what, I would step that his boat up before I stepped my boat up because right. the the Viper will handle over a hundred miles an hour, no problem. Right. Your father my boat. That. My boat. Yeah. I do not. I mean, everybody I know, including myself, that has been in or run Sutfins, they get squirrely up in the high nineties. Right. Even even um, even a Fast Company, and he you know he was set up with the big drives and everything. He wasn't running Bravos on extension boxes and all. My boat is the only difference between my boat and uh, Fast Company, which everybody's telling me is going to be a huge difference is my boat was rigged and CG'd by Richie. Right. They moved the gas tanks where they wanted to move. See, my gas tanks are completely different than Fast Company. Fast Company, it was underneath the floor, and his ran a lot further up. In Mine's all back, and, and, and that's why I don't have a back seat, again, because the tank sticks up. If you were to... We have a faux back seat that goes there for when they ran factory class right. so that they could have a back seat. But um, it's not really a back seat because if you tried to sit in it, there your knees hit the the bolsters. Right. You know, the race bolsters in the front. There, there's no room there for your legs. Right. Um, because it's all gas tank. Right. Um, and all that supposedly was set up in conjunction with the, with the extension boxes and the drives and all because that boat originally had... Big drop number threes on it. Right. I don't know. Something if like that. Now, you run, you're not miles. running transmissions. No. No. no so we're running Bravos. It might have made a little difference that the motors were a little further forward, right, with the transmissions. Right. You yeah, know, they might, weren't just transmissions. He actually ran uh, shafts on them too. Right. So I so would imagine all the on fast company. On fast company, yeah. they were all the way up. Right. So I would imagine he did that for you know. Also, you have to remember the day and age. Back then, they ran a lot bigger water. Oh right! You know they went further offshore more often and than further, right? Oh, yeah. They had the long; they were long track racing. Yeah, so you had there. to keep the bow down. You right. didn't want to have to run 65, 70 miles in six footers with your tabs folded under you and the yep. drives folded under you. And you know you wanted to kind of let the boat run. So back in the day, they moved a lot of stuff back because they had so much of the hardware pushed forward. Right. You know to try to kind of counteract that. You know the balancing issue there, which which what you might find is with a lot of your weight in your boat being shifted back, it'll run fantastic in the the flat to medium rough, and then from there you may just have to put a little weight in front of it to well, hold the front I have, down. And I, and I have a ballast tank. Yeah, there you so, go. You know, you know I mean? and we can pump in and out, and 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 the way that they have the ballast tank set up, I mean, they, they, when he when he did it, it, it was ingenious. But the way Richie set it up, I mean, we can we can. We can pump that ballast tank in full in, what, eight or ten seconds? Right. Hoses. Right, and, and, we can, and we can blow it just as fast. It just as fast. Right. You, you know, so, I mean, it, the way it's set up, I mean, you could, you could even, you could fill it just to enter a turn and then blow it coming out the other side. Right. You, you know, if you, if you want to. Well, and that's, see, that's where the science comes in in bracket class. See, for a lot of years, they used the term monster garage, right? Bracket right. class is monster garage. It's not. I mean, it is as scientific as any other class in offshore. Just we're allowed to build our own motors. Right. You know, right. You know, like what you're looking at there with ballast tanks. And see, that's technology that prior in bracket class wasn't really significant. Right. You know, whereas now, today's day and age, these boats are much more dialed in. You have guys where when I started racing, like a, a Point Pleasant race for me when I was young was a 60 mile an hour day 
You know what I mean? You right. went out, and if you were average in 60, the last lap you could kind of really hang it out there and maybe get the next couple. Look at today's class, class six, right? Because I, I was in six then. Look at today's class six. You have a guy in Franny Bell and a Larry Smith Scarab that'll sit at 69 miles an hour. It doesn't matter how big it is. Right. You know, so it the times have definitely changed. Yeah. You know, so and that's a, that. That's so much fun to me is the setup work. Oh yeah, and 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 having a mile an hour limit that you have to run up against is a complete change too. I mean, back when when Fast Company was originally racing B class, C class, yeah. I mean, the object was to go as fast as you could go with the setup that you were allowed to have in that class, and you would win. But now. That's not the case right. because all these boats we know will go faster than 85 miles an hour, oh, yeah. but you can't do it. Right. You know what I mean? So now not only do you have to figure out how to get to that mile an hour fast, you got to be able to hold that in any water right. and not go over. Yeah. You know? And that's, um, a, and that's funny and because – and there's a lot of – you know, t- just take your pick of – typically purchased power boats right they they're all they all shine bright in their particular circumstance right right? so what separates it from a race boat to a pleasure boat like that you know is can it do it all the time like your sup fin like the tempest where you can run 100 miles an hour and imagine that in flat water as easily as you can in four footers right you know and that's what separates them from the rest of the you know the the pleasure boat world right you know and, and it is. Bracket class racing really brought in a new thought process to what I, I would say is a pretty archaic, you know, sport. I mean, it, we haven't changed much. No, it's, it's true. It's other than the fact that we moved it in closer for fans to see and sponsor purchases and stuff like that. But, you know, we our race courses have changed. But the sport, the thought process and, and what you're trying to accomplish hasn't. No. You know, so it, it's, pre- it's pretty cool. You know, it really is. Bracket class racing's... You can you can bring anything you want to bring. That's it. You know? And I and and you know the whole thing the whole thing that would hold up. Imagine that I think is like the conversation that we've had before. Is you get into class three and that boat will do it. It'll do it no problem. The problem is is the guy that you're up against. Like you said, if you, they're in a canopy. They're sitting in a. Uh, they're strapped into a seat with shock absorbers. They've got air conditioning blowing on them. It's a completely different race for him right. than it is for the guy that's right. standing up. You know, in which in, in this particular conversation, that guy is me. Right. So <laughs> you. So like you know, and, and this it's why we don't race that boat anymore. Is is you'll quickly realize how good your boat is, and then you'll want to push it. Right. Well, we pushed it from an 85 mile an hour class to a 90 mile an hour class back then then from 90 to 95 which was went from local three to performance three um and we were running with sbi my brother got a little overzealous and i believe it was marathon florida in 2003 and uh started trying to race the helicopter and uh because he was bored and uh so carbonell disqualified him and my old man and moved them up to class two which was 105 the only problem was in class two was a 47 foot apache called firewater with triple 1550s in it I remember that, boat. that boat could sit at 103 miles an hour it didn't matter what was in front of it right it could have been a, a literal tsunami it would have yeah. just went over it <laughs> it's just, yeah. you know they the, could push those things up and just leave them that's it man <laughs> and suddenly you find out why you need a bigger boat you know like you, that little 32 footer will do it until it won't and when it won't it gets bad real quick right. you know whereas when you're talking about the guys like us where you're in the fountain and you're belted in in shock absorbing seats with literal air conditioning and you know i mean just the windshield one one simple thing right when you're running 85 90 95 miles an hour you can hardly hold that helmet on your head Right. You're running up the front stretch, and that helmet's trying to literally pull your head off your shoulders. When you're in the fountain, I don't feel a goddamn thing. Oh, right. Yeah. I don't. I don't even. I, we get all done with, like, a Ocean City, Maryland, or a Point Pleasant, or something just real rough and snotty, or Inglewood Sunday. I got out of that Class 7 boat and into the fountain, so it's a little different. But I, I got out of the fountain feeling pretty all right 
for having done what we just did. Right. Versus trying to stand, hang on in the wind. You know, if, if you catch an edge, you go swimming. No, or, or if you, you get, know, or, or if you take a good wash down, it's tough. Yeah, you know? it is. It's hard. So I and, and I, I think that the answer to that is the fountains truthfully do not belong in class three. They belong in a much faster class. Any one of those three fountains can run 105 miles an hour, and two out of three of them can run 110. But did you ever think, if they don't want to move up or run faster, why can't we have class three as open and class three as uh, closed? We could. And um, you run them both simultaneously, but you're not technically racing well, against the, each other. The driving force between any new additional class is participants. That's what I was going to get at. If people in class four say, hey, now we have 10 or 12 or 14 boats, it's just too many boats side by side. You say, all right, right well... Your open, you know, your open, open cockpit. Like uh, you know, five or six of you say, "Hey, we want to run class three, but we won't run against the fountains. Just run them side by side, but just say this is the open version. This is the well, closed cockpit." And I think that you do have a case there. Like, and and I don't mean to throw them into the fire here, but like Nate Hunt, for instance, I think Nate would have definitely put a three on the front of that Apache if it didn't have to run against the fountains. Yeah, because oh, I would imagine think about right. now you guys are understanding what it took to build your two right, right? Mm-hmm. now imagine all i have to do is change the oil and put spark plugs in my 525s and i can run 105 all year with no problem right if you're nate hunt and you're looking at that big 41 apache with the big drives with the big motors and the big cost big blowers with big car do you want to go sit them wide open at 95 miles an hour and try to catch a fountain that's running 4200 rpm no and i don't and i and i honestly don't think that it would stay together right you know what i mean and if if it does it's how long is it going to stay together right because it is a machine right and and like i i preach about is your budget thing i mean for nate he understands that this is totally illogical for me to do this with this boat if i'm allowed to 85 great and that's what he decided to do but to make him run class three now i completely agree with him that why would you ever want to try and go catch those fountains i mean rough water flat water there is no advantage six or seven laps into it those fountains are just going to take over you know and so i do believe that they need to be moved to the 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 right class as super v where they should have always been they're all dead nuts even so they're really well, and they all originally were, right? Yeah. Because I, I mean in Louis's boat and your dad's boat both have V V's on. Yeah. Right? So that that's originally where Yeah, it should have never changed. Um I don't really understand why it did. But uh, they need to go back in the class that they belong in or at least a faster bracket class where, you know, your ideas of racing one and four and running three makes a whole lot of sense. Right. Right? And and then you can kind of take guys like Nate Hunt and move them into class three if if he wanted to. You know, not saying that he has to, but I think he would really jump at that opportunity. Oh, probably. If there was no canopy boats, I mean, I yeah. can't speak for him, but I would think that he would definitely really think about it. Yeah, absolutely. You know and I'm mean? not saying that Nate could never beat the fountains. I think there's a whole lot of scenarios where Nate beats the fountains. I think you're exactly right. Uh, yeah. I mean, and I'd love it, to see you, a you get some boats. really rough water. Yeah. It's an yeah. Apache. But it's, it's just it's just the, the thought process of if he cooks a motor versus if we cook a motor. Oh, exactly. My guardian mode says, hey, we're a little light on oil pressure. Pressure. Right. Not his. Nope. You know, it's it's a big, big difference. So I agree with him, and I think I agree with you guys as well, that I think that the, if the fountains just slid up a class or went back to, you know, being Super V, um, it would open up a, a really good opportunity there, as much as I would hate to see any boats come out of class four right now. Yeah. Because I, I just, I love when it turns into that crowd. Oh, well, and it's going to be a good class yeah you know what i mean it, it's it seems like there's going to be a good number of boats yeah yeah it might right. get to the point it might have its own start i mean you turn yeah. around and have 14 18 boats or you know if it gets there in a year or two well, yeah that's the you other might thing have to too, run right? it by itself i mean because i know you got seven or eight boats between first race and second race and, and we were talking about that i'm like I, I don't know because i said you know you're running 85 miles an hour and i'm going to run over someone that's running 65 in an outboard or I'm sitting there running 85, and I got Miss Geico coming around me at double, almost double my speed. Well, so, so I I have a odd thought process on that. Is I like having other classes on the course, and I, and I'll, I'll tell you why. I think growing up, at, much like you guys did as a fan, the one thing that I could always pick apart was which boat was faster. 
right? Like that to me was, and you could make that as scientific as you want to make it or as simple as I just stated it, but you could watch a class four boat come by a class five boat and go, okay, I get that, right? Right. And I think the fans need that. I think they need the chaos. I think they need to see the the class fours overtaking the class sevens to understand like, okay, that's what 60 looks like. And that's what 85 looks like. That's a, right? that's a real But there definitely point. comes a time where it becomes unsafe. And, and you see that in some of the greater speed differences. Like 85 to 60 isn't, even though it seems like it, it's not the biggest speed difference. You get, like with, with us in the fountains, right? There's multiple times over the course of last year where, or the year prior where me and my father would come up in the fountain on a class five boat. So that's 75 to probably every bit of 105, 106, which is a huge jump. And you come out of the turn and they're only 100 yards in front of me, it takes me the whole straightaway to get them. Right. You know, versus like a super stock running 110, 115 running up on a class six boat. Or, uh, so there's certain situations where we do absolutely avoid that. But I think that for like a, a, a class like Class 4, where it's, it's I think the majority is open cockpit, right? You only have one, yeah. the Edward J. Payne and Catamaran, which runs primarily in the Michigan circuit, the single outboard catamaran. Right. I don't think I've, I don't I think don't think think I've, I've seen, seen him in point or in Florida, really, right? No, I think he, I think he sticks up north with that. Um, in Ozarks, I think. And you know what it is, and I agree with Rick completely. You can't have a boat like that and not just run it on the pins. That's sure. such a crazy, hairy, little wild ride. You got to go let it eat. Sure. But he knows it's too small to contend in the ocean or even in a bay. You know, I mean, think about, you know, your, your boat or your boat in the bay and four footers versus getting in a 28 foot cat with a single outboard. Right. My boat's no fun in the bay. I mean, I'll do it for Mark Henderson if he wants to set a bay <laughs> race, but I can tell you I had it in the bay and it's like, it's asleep. I mean, it's, like I said, I'm it's all the same about as your that. father's boat. And I, you know, I, I drove it and I'm just like, this isn't fun. Right. I, I I'm mean, all about that though. I mean, how do you feel about a bay race? Oh, I loved it. We right. did it. I mean, we I, did it. And uh, I remember Mark, them watching every one of them. You know what I mean? Going out, anchoring the boat, watching them. It, the bay races were always great. I, you know, I can understand the uh, money aspect of it, though. There's really nothing out there to try to pull sponsors for. No, but I've, I've said this. We do, and, and I don't know if this is a popular opinion or not, but we do have races that are for the fans and for the the sport in general and then we have races that are really just for us you know and and that's happened over the years i mean if you could think back to when we ran cambridge maryland in in that uh five-star hyatt hotel there wasn't you you would have had to have been a hotel guest to watch the race it's kind of it's, it was all private right. but they opened it up to the racers and it was like we were at home you know, and we did that for years, and we never got any fans or sponsors out of it or anything like that. But it was just a great weekend to kind of pat the guys on the back and say thank you. You know, and right. and, and I, I I just I think that the Barnegat Bay race is that. That's great. It's and so much fun. The the platform can be done better than most of the other sites because if you can get your hands on say Berkeley Island. Um, and, and take that over and set up tenting and uh, you know have food and alcohol there. It, I, I think it's I don't know if it's a state park or a county park or a township park, Berkeley Island, but you also have um, the means for lifting boats in down at like say Cedar Creek Sailing Center and stuff, and it's all right there. And people oh, can come we, and you can bring everyone in and you can sit right there and listen. And they they did. We we ran that race. I think. Uh, in 2016 i believe or maybe 17 and uh it went over amazing i mean we had the boats were on the seaside boardwalk on friday night yeah. they let us bring all the boats up on the boardwalk and and I mean, they just they rolled out the red carpet for us the race was unbelievable we had a million boats anchored up around the race course which i love i love spectator boats oh, yeah. so because i, I in I don't knock any way that anybody gets to an offshore race and watches an offshore race. But to me, the coolest thing is I grew up as a spectator boat. I grew up on the outskirt of the race course or, yep. you know, and to me, that is the coolest thing that you can possibly do is, is to literally be in your pleasure boat watching, watching what's going on. Because you can understand. I mean, you're, you're anchored up and you're feeling that roll, 
right? And you're like, man, these guys are running 140 miles an hour in this. Right. These guys are, you know, and, and to me, that is so cool. It's different than watching it from the beach. Well, and you have that in Barnegat because it's such a normal. It's such a, everybody goes to Ticey Shoals and anchors up. Everybody does a, a float, a float with a flotillas. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Everybody does this, right? So it's, it's so normal. So, and then with the surrounding area with, you know, with Seaside or however you want to work that race, it is an awesome event. And the Barnegat Bay is very misleading for people who aren't used to it. Whereas you don't realize that that bay can get as shitty as fours, fives. It, it can. Especially I mean, it down can. by Barnegat Light. I mean, you come in, you're coming around the, um, the, the mouth of the uh, inlet. And I've seen most times it's calm. But, yeah, it, it can get pretty snotty there. Mm. And you come back down by Tom's River and it can be like glass. So. Yeah. It does yeah. change. From it one offers side an to awesome, an awesome event. I didn't know that Mark was working at putting that together. That's, 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 that's what he. That's what he told me. You know, and 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 he he got a hold of me and he says, uh, you know, would I want to help? And I said, yeah, absolutely. You know yeah. what I mean? I, to help out, do it if there's anything I can do. But yeah, I'm all about that. I mean, I, I, I was so disappointed when, I, and I don't even know why because there's a lot of other races around. But I was so disappointed when the Barnegat Bay race ended. And then I had this this grant, like, I don't know who came up with the that the Triple Crown this year, you know, yeah. if that was your dad or yeah. what, uh, down in Florida. I start thinking to myself, I'm like, man, what if we did a Northeast Triple Crown? Well, where yeah. it was like Point Pleasant, Barnegat Bay, and maybe like Ocean City or, or, we had or Hepatcon or something like that. We did it. We did a... Uh, great. In a... Uh, years are crazy i believe it was 07 um geico sponsored the triple crown for us we had i believe it was point pleasant atlantic city and ocean city atlantic city is another good one yeah and atlantic city you know granted it was prior to this covid thing but atlantic city wanted a boat race back in a really bad way did they yeah now you have to remember for the last four or five months right. there's been zero revenue in that right. city i mean there's i mean zero it's it i mean like how you see the pictures of las vegas with not a soul on the strip just like that. Yeah. I mean, yeah, in, in an area that couldn't afford that to begin with. Right. You know, so we'll see moving forward, but that's another prospect. Um, there's a lot of great places to go boat racing. The hard part is we need more people like yourselves that are willing to get involved. Um, people don't necessarily realize what some of these promoters go through to make these things happen. Oh, yeah. It's not it's, uh, it's not an easy thing to put together. No. You, you know what I mean? It's all about money. Yeah. And, um, and permission. Yeah, you know permission's I mean? a big thing. The big thing people, is though, there's a lot of volunteers, let me tell you. And, oh, yeah. yeah. And the lot. people around it have to want it as well, meaning the town itself. Yeah. You know, I, I've never raced in Inglewood, but, but going there and being in Key West and stuff and seeing a town that truly oh, wants you can something tell that to they go want on. You there. Yeah. You versus know? a town that's like, well, we'll have it. We kind of want you here. Yeah. We're doing I mean, it. And you there's, can truly see the difference. In, yeah. And there's a lot of examples. Louis, Louis G. Contieri that runs Strictly Business. Right. He put on a race in Patchock, Long Island for a couple of years there. I think four or five years. Um, it moved around. It was in Freeport. It was in Long Beach. It was in you know Patchock. But his constant battle wasn't raising money. He had all the money. It, it wasn't the money. It wasn't the fans. It wasn't the teams. It was the city just crippling him every time he wanted to do something. I mean, if he wanted to use this this little field over here to put a vendor, they would hammer him for it because right. they didn't really want the boat race. They were looking at this as a way for them to make some money, yep. which is unfortunately the the case almost everywhere we go. You know, is they they think that when you when you see our sport, it is such a high profile sport. It just doesn't get the recognition that it that it once got. But when you see these big power boats, it's always associated with big checkbooks. Yep. Always. I mean, it doesn't matter. I have friends of mine. You guys just walk through our shop here. We're not knocking the world dead here. We're still working hard every day. I mean, there's no... Yeah, and everybody in this, everybody that does this is. Yeah, you but if I mean? you There ask... are a few guys out there that are independently wealthy. Oh, sure, sure. Right? Yeah, but... and, and, good for, and great for them. Yeah. Just, I, if you could see the amount of people that come up to me like, you know, oh, well, you got the money. Why don't you just do this? Yeah. You have right. no idea, man. No. <laughs> no. I got passion. That's <laughs> I don't it. have money. That's it. You know? If only I ever had the money, we'd be in good shape. <laughs> only it. And you probably have a little bit more money if we didn't have the boats. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Probably close to quadruple. <laughs> 
but it is it's awesome it, it, and we do and you touched on it how many volunteers we have that is i wish that i could get a printout of every single one of their names i would do a show just thanking them all individually right because when we go particularly to inglewood right that is probably our worst case scenario for a layout Right, we have that one tiny little parking lot up against the beach on a one lane in, one lane out main road to the bridge that gets you on and off the island. Right. On top of that, we're gonna put the crane in there. Right. The, right. If you looked at that on paper, you'd be like, "There's no way it's we're gonna be happen. able to do this." But, right. but it, it's orchestrated so well. Go like a, walk a, around a, there. By mind. You'll you'll meet these volunteers that make that thing work, and every single one of them are more excited than you are. You're right there. They love it. And they, I mean, they have, I mean, I'm not sure who runs the whole show or, or, you know, the ins and outs of everything, but I do know Ray Labadee very personally. And, and he, the, his work down there in Inglewood with his volunteers, it, it's got to be contagious. Because when you talk to Ray Labadee, there isn't another race in the country other than Inglewood. Right. He puts his whole entire time and effort into that event. He bleeds that event. And that's how that's and, and how a lot of them are, I will right? tell you, it, it shows. I mean, I've been, like I said, I haven't been to all of them. I haven't raced any of them as of yet. But I, you know, when I went down, I even told Jay, he keeps telling me you got to go to um, uh, Fort Myers. But, um, oh, man. He's yeah, like, another he's like, great he, one. He's like, Inglewood's great, but he's like, you got to see Fort Myers. But let me tell you, I, it blew my mind. I went down there. And nothing against Point Pleasant. I was expecting Point Pleasant. I'm like, I came all the way to Florida to see these races. There's no way I can compete with, like, Key West, you know, in the 80s and 90s and stuff. And I was on the phone with him, and even the night of the uh, parade, I'm calling people. I'm like, I'm standing there, and I'm like, there's no boats here. I don't know what time it was. We'll just say 7.50. Oh, like, there's no boats. I'm hilarious. like, hilarious. He's like, like hey, this place is a ghost town. Oh, and I'm like, I don't understand how. I'm, I'm, like, I'm watching it on, on online right now. There's people everywhere. Um, Within 10 minutes. They it, walked up on all it. All of a sudden, you, you know, the music starts playing and we're walking down the street. You know, I was expecting it to be more chaotic in a sense. And then all of a sudden you see all the boats come in and it gets dark and then the street is packed, you know, yeah. all the, I'd say bars and restaurants, but, you know, everything is packed. Well, yeah, it's not bars and restaurants there, but yeah, it's, it's vendors. It's yeah, vendors. They bring in the vendors say, and all, but... It's not really bars and you know, restaurants, but... And, they, they and I don't, there. like, when I talk about Inglewood, I don't mean to come off as if I'm knocking down any other promotion mm-hmm. or promoter or race site. I just happen to really thoroughly enjoy that one. Well, and it's good because, like you said, it's small, right? And they pack everything in there. But that's actually a good thing. Well, and because that's it. everything is right there. Well, and it's not just that. See, for me, my biggest kicks of the weekend is hanging out with you guys, mm-hmm. right? Like right. I, I don't get me wrong. I itch the way everybody else does to get in the <laughs> boat on Sunday. But if you ask me, what the best part of boat racing is, it's the boat racers. It's I have so much fun with everybody involved. I, I just I can't wait to walk around the pits and talk to everybody and who's got crazy stories about what they had to do to get here. They blew a trailer, they blew the truck up, it's at a dealership in North Carolina, they're in a rental that they gotta bring the boat to the dealership to pick up their truck. So this isn't home. just me. That that's this is, no, this is everybody. I mean I was hauling a boat last week. I, I was laying on the ground in the pouring rain with a, yep. a torch torching a front drive shaft out of a yep. truck and it's great. It's like to me, I, I can't wait to do that. And when you go to Inglewood, you get the best possible scenario for that, right? Because in you could throw a stone and hit any team you want to talk to. If you go to a bar to hang out with the guys, nobody's like going to tell you, oh, well, they went to that bar down the road and they went to – there's two bars. That's right. I was going to say. There's and they're literally across the street from each, each other. other. Right. <laughs> it's, it, it's awesome. It, it's, it's the best thing. And the fans get the best, the best kicks out of – hanging out with the racers and it doesn't get any better than that in Inglewood yeah I mean it's just you're, you're at that sandbar you're at the pool hall across the street you're you know and, and the fans are right in there with you no and, and that's and that's so cool too I mean I remember too you know growing up how cool is it when you like you're there and all these guys that race boats are all there and they're wearing their shirts and they're doing this and they're doing that and it's like it, it's it's like you're a kid and you're like, oh my god, like you like like you're going into a NASCAR event. Right. You know well what to I mean? them to them the racers are actually famous. I mean, you know, you look at yourself or your brother and you say or your father, it's like, well, no, you I, I can't speak for you, but you're probably like, Well, I'm not really famous, but to other people you very well are. Right. Well, because you know, I think the reason for that is 
it's not. Um, I think this is a very humbling sport. It is. Um, it like, not. We won't name any names, but off the top of your head, pick out like one of the real conceited assholes. It's hard to find one. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, like it, when I say that, nobody's face came flying into your yeah. mind. Right. We don't have that. Because at, at any given time, you can get beat by any other racer. Yep. It, I mean, it's, it's that good now. I mean, it's not... I, I, I can't speak to what it was back in the day. I can speak to what it's been for the last 20 years. Right. Okay? And I can honestly tell you that I'm seeing the best competition that this sport has seen in the last two decades. Yeah. I can tell you that in full confidence. So if you're going to walk around and be an asshole and be cocky and out in front like that, you're going to eat it quickly. Yeah. It's going to happen. It's, it's true. You know... And I, I think that that's why you don't get that rock star type of feeling because, like, I I don't I I've never felt that way. I never got treated that way. I never waited in line to meet Dave Branch. I never waited in line to meet Kurt Berger. I never, you know, you just walk up and shake their hand and say whatever it is that you had to say right. quickly because we got shit to do. Right. <laughs> like, you know, but it, it's it's never been that sport. I mean, even, you know, you, you look back to when Hulk Hogan was doing Start Your Engines or Don Johnson was racing. Or, right. These guys were accessible. I mean, you, you could talk to Chuck Norris. Right. You could, I mean, this, the, you sat in the same driver's meeting as this guy. I mean, it, it's not, you, you don't get that. And, and I think that that's probably my favorite part of this whole sport is, is how personable it really is. I have more fun hanging out with fans and like I, I, there's nothing I'd rather be doing you know there, it's just it, it's it's my dream I, it's I think what a lot of people that that are around this sport dream about is is if we could ever get to that rock star level but if we never do I'm fine with that too it's a pretty awesome sport it's true right it's it's about the boat racing really. yeah is what it's about it's to me it's the time in which you have that chin strap under your chin and the visor's closed and you're ready to rock and roll that's right. To me, that's what it's about. I could care less about everything else. Right. I'll keep doing whatever it is I have to do here. I'll change as many water pumps and do as many oil changes as need be right. as long as I can still go boat racing. Right. <laughs> Just you to know. throw it into the boat. Yeah, I don't need to be treated special. You know? no, I but agree. I appreciate that. I, I do. I appreciate that. I, I sometimes forget how long we've been doing this. You know, yeah. I, I uh, For me, I'm starting to feel it. I, uh, you know, I, I get in boats sometimes. I was like Jeremy. I, uh, I told that story on the last podcast, and it, it was 100% true. You know, we, we were going out that inlet, and I don't scare. I don't have that. I have a, a uh, conquering mindset when you get in a race boat. It, it, nothing's too big. You know, we got in, in that Class 7 boat when we were heading for the inlet. I was shitting my pants. Right. <laughs> was, I'm thinking, I've got too many of these under my belt. I don't know how many more I could yeah. take. Right. Know? Well, the good news is, though, you look over at Jeremy, and he's just like, Okay. <laughs> he was ready to rock and roll, man. And, and you know, I, I I would race with Jeremy no matter what. But that was like the coolest thing to me. Sometimes I go into like a lull where this starts to feel really normal. It starts to feel like something we just do. Right. You know, you when like for me, fortunately, I go to every single race. You know, we we have to be there, right? I mean, that that's basically our job, right? So to me, it gets normal. It gets, you know, this is, I, I know I have to be in this town at this time and this year and, and next year and the year after that. And, and you just kind of start to go through the motions. And then every once in a while, you talk to guys like you guys. You talk to guys like Jeremy. And it, it brings it all back. And that's what happened this year for me. When, when I got in the Class 7 boat with Jeremy, his girlfriend Chrissy has to be the most excited person in a 20 square mile radius of that race site, no matter what else is going on. That's it, the biggest fan. Right boat there. racing is the coolest shit in the world to her, and to him, it's everything he wants to do. It, right. it, it is just, it, it, it doesn't matter if it's a Class 7 boat or if it's AMH or if it's WHM, or it doesn't matter to him. He just wants to go out there and run a boat. And I haven't felt that in such a long time. I had so much fun running with Jeremy. I can't explain it to people. I, you know, it's, it, it, it renews it. It yeah. renews it for you, you know. And uh, I appreciate, I appreciate that. that. That's the one thing that I think people take away from this sport when they leave is you, you had the most fun you'll ever have. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. I can't wait, man. I can't wait. And it's like it, and and it's 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 been the worst season. Because right. it's like every time you're almost there and you're all psyched and then it's like, yeah, not happening. Yeah. And then you almost get there again and it's like, not happening. 
Now, for us, it actually turned out to be pretty good because yeah, we weren't ready. I was just going to say, you, you, you know, right. it, it kind of worked out that these things have not been happening. But I tell you what, that if we weren't ready and there was a race, I'd find something to get in. Right. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's enough people out there. Yeah. Um, I just have to say, you know, I wish I had Nate's crew. I, I don't know if it's just him and his wife, but if they want to come up and help me. Oh, my God. If they can build he a boat in a stuff week. done I, I, so fast. I don't know if there's it's editing. unbelievable. Yeah, I don't know if it's editing or what he's doing, but I'm like, I don't <laughs> I know need, how I you need build a crew. Like, I think it's, I think it's a little TV magic. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think it, it is. might be, but I tell you what, man, it was like, it, it seemed like, Empty hall with water testing. I'm like, how did that took us a year? Well, the problem too is, is he's in Florida, so it's sunny and well, there's palm trees. He could have started two years ago, and the pictures would look the same. Everything would look well, the that, same. And the other thing is, See, too, here we're like, there's snow. There's it's forest. a lot easier to work on a boat when you can have it in a garage in December with the door open right. than like what we were doing at that point of the right is where we were still pulling we're still pulling engines out yeah so we're still into where your hands are getting soaking wet you're getting oil all over yourself you're getting all, you know what i mean and it's 30 outside yeah right so and it, i had to build the shop too. oh that's the other thing too in the in the midst of this we have our we shop have, we had to build, build a building we had to right. build a building to put the two boats because he tells right. me we'll just put them in the shop every time we're going to work on them i'm like well that was my original idea like, my original I, I I have a, a big hangar, right? right? But when you put airplanes in it, it gets, gets small. Gets small. <laughs> so my idea was, we'll, we'll keep them outside. <laughs> this is my idea. Well, the snow and when, them. <laughs> and, when, and when we want to work on them, we'll pull them in because, you know, the shop is always, we always keep the shop at like 68 degrees. Right. Always. Um, that's like one of my pet peeves. Like I, I worked in cold shops. I'm done with that. I, I put in my time. This is my shop now, and it's going to be nice. Right. Um, and it was. There were some times where it was so nasty that we did have to bring them in. Um, but we ended up building a building um, to put both boats in, and um, it's been you know it's it's been great. Uh, it's, you know, but you still have to heat it. Yeah. And I, and I envy that. That is that's so nice. I mean, you guys have a great setup because. For us here, it's difficult. We have a big building here, but it's full of customer stuff. Right. So when it's time to work on our stuff, you gotta roll all the customer stuff up. You know, clean everything out. I mean, it, I mean, it's just. I wish sometimes I just had somewhere to go play with my race boat. Well, I know? have a shop. My shop, being in the marine industry, is similar to yours. Right. Um, and that's originally where I had the boat. And the first thing I told him was, I was like, I don't work in this shop because it's not heated or air conditioned. I was like. In the summer, we work outside with the guys because it's literally cooler outside than it is right. in the building. And in the winter, I work outside because it's literally you go outside to warm up. Right. So he's like, we'll just work on them there. And I'm like, you don't get it. You, you can't heat a building no, at that no. size. And, and, you and can't it turns cool. out to not be uh, – it's not convenient. Right. It's you know what I mean? When you, have to, when you have to get, in, get into a, a, a car and drive all the way over to Delaware – you know what I mean? To, to work on the boat. You don't get those days where you can put in an hour. Well, and on most the boat, of the time, you know, whenever you have those days, you usually had shit you had to get done beforehand. Right. So you're shot. And right. when home is 10 minutes that way and the race boat is an hour and a half that way, that's right. I know exactly. the drill. It's, yeah. it's, it's a, it was a lot easier now after we built it, the, the building, where if I'm working during the day, you know, at the end of the day, I can just go behind the shop, go into the other building, and the boat's there. And the, the great thing about it is it's always uncovered. The hatch is always up. So it's not like you don't have that 15, 20-minute routine just to get into the boat to work on it. Right. You know what I mean? Everything is already open and ready to go. So you could just go in there and, you know, put in 20 minutes. Right. You know, uh, right. It, you know. I've gone a little overboard with the building. Um, he's yelling at me all the time. He's like, "We don't need electricity. I got fans in there, electric." He's like, "I'm he putting wants to run air conditioning. I'm putting air conditioning, he wants to put air conditioning in it." He goes, "Who's paying the electric bill?" I said, "Not me. I don't, I'm plugging it into your building." He's going he's to run a line into my building so he can run air conditioning in there. I put yeah. LED lights in. I mean, don't worry. Don't worry. Nick. It's cheap when you're not paying. <laughs> 
like I told you, I'm you know I'm getting the boat. I don't know who's paying for it. But <laughs> well, it's and, like and I'm this getting whole, AC. This whole time I've been wondering. You've been bringing up paying for stuff and all your sponsors, but you haven't named any of them. So what do you got? Um, we got the, one of our biggest sponsors is a company called Custom Built Products. They're over in PA. They do laser cutting for like U-Haul trailers and whatnot. Um, Al and and Dave Payne, they've been great. I mean, I, he has to have as much or more money in that boat than I have in it. Right. You know what I mean? They built everything we've needed. I mean, the boat when it came, it didn't have the raw water intakes on it. They were still sucking through the drives. Um, I looked through all the raw water you know things that were available out there. I didn't like any of them. Right. So he says, well, what do you want? And I drew them, and he's like, okay. And they custom made everything for us out of stainless, um, all the way down to, uh, you know, stupid stuff. Like, um, we didn't like the way that the fuel was returning. You know, the fuel, the way it was returning, it was, we were sending hot fuel back to the engine, or warm fuel back to the engine. So he made these custom fuel returns for us that, that, that go in line with the, with the filler drains and, and everything. It, it's like... Anything we could possibly have needed, um, you know, they just fabricated right up for us. I, I was building the engines, and because he, he goes, I want the motor plates on the engines when they're sitting in the shop as we're putting everything together because you got the blowers and you have, you know, the, the oil system and everything. And, uh, yeah, Al comes over. He's pulling out a tape measure. As I'm literally putting stuff on the motor, and it's on an engine horse. I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I'm measuring. Oh, for and the then offshore come, mounts. And then he comes back with these brackets for the offshore mount like a week later. And he's like, here, I, I made these for you. So then now the motors can sit in the offshore mounts right. and sit on the floor. On the floor. Yeah, which if anybody listening to this doesn't understand how important that is. Oh. It's unbelievable. I and work on more motors hanging from a forklift, chasing it around in circles, so, trying to put bell yeah. housings on them. And, <laughs> and he designed these things. So yeah, when right. they're on the offshore mounts, I can go in with the forklift and pick the whole motor up. Right. Yeah. Mounts and all, so we can work on it at like you know at, at the right level. Right. And then when you're done, just put it right back down onto the ground. Right. It, it's unbelievable. Yeah, fabrication, well, fabricators in this sport are irreplaceable. Oh, absolutely. I mean, they, they, I, I can't tell you how many things every day I'm like, I wish I could just make that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yep. like, you know, every little specialty tool or every, I mean, all day. I mean, I wish I had a all, local. All, all kinds of little stuff like that. It just, it goes a long way. And, and, and I can't think of everything, but I mean, th- there has been so much that he fabricated in the boat i mean every time we change something something needed to be fabricated and he's just like yeah whatever just let me what's know. the name of his company one more time? Uh, custom built products custom built products okay. um and uh you know so uh, apex marine and like we already talked about uh paul from uh, uh windsor automotive have been unbelievable i mean paul basically just opened up his machine shop uh to us to do whatever we wanted to do to these motors i mean down to threading like I said, everything's metric on his boat. Um, my my boat, I don't have any sponsors. It's me. Right. Um, I sponsor myself. Um, you should get that sticker, like Talladega yeah. Nights. Sponsor, <laughs> sponsored, by, sponsored by me. me. For me. By me. Um, you know, I wake up in the morning and I piss excellence. <laughs> but um, but uh, you know, he has a part like uh, his his um. The rams for your uh, oh, K-planes, yeah. oh my God. The rams for the K-planes were put together wrong, Nick. So you couldn't somebody, get them apart. Somebody had rebuilt them over the years, and they put them back together wrong. And then, I guess when they realized it, they went to take the, um, the, the, the uh, C-clip off of it, and they broke the eyes off of the C-clips. Oh, shit. <laughs> so there was goes, no way to get. He had to machine them out. Had right. to machine them out. We, we bring him over to Paul because he goes, "Who's going to fix this?" I go, "If anyone can do anything, Paul can do right. anything." And right. of course, you call Richie Jr. and you say, "What what pistons do you think your dad might have used when he built the boat?" <laughs> and the, the you know what I get in return. Probably whatever was laying around the shop. <laughs> because we, I said, we got these pistons and they don't look like key hoffers. They, I mean, they don't look like anything. anything. Like, like nice. I couldn't even figure out how to rebuild them. Right. And he goes, yeah, they were probably something that were laying around the shop that were like really, really awesome pistons. And my dad was like, yep, that's what we're going to use on these. Yeah. I mean, sometimes I, I have plenty of that. 
laying right. around. I mean, from the green boat over the years, that was, that was, you know, we could, I could go all day with silly fixes on that boat, but everything was swept up. Right. I mean, I, I, I didn't have that kind of money back then. It was just whatever I could find to make it work. And a lot of times the, the shit with no name on it was better than, you know, a, an Imco shaft or, a, right. I mean, you know, you, you never know. And right. I'm know. sitting there, so, so he takes it apart and then they wouldn't come apart. Like we couldn't get him apart. So he's like, now what do we do? So I take, he's got a 60 ton press and he's like, what are you going to do? And I make, I, I weld up this, <laughs> this like U clamp that, cause it's a Ram, you know, it's sitting in here right. and I welded up this U clamp that would press down on the one side to press the thing apart. And, and we, we put I'm every duck, bit of the 60 tons I'm on I'm ducking right. behind the I-beam of the press and I'm holding a torch and this thing is just creaking and popping. And he's like, I'm like, if this thing comes off this press, we're dying or it's going through the wall. It's killing someone <laughs> in the next building over. And finally, the first one came apart. And then it was the same thing with the second one. Right. Yeah, he's, got four, he's got four rams. Right. And, and yeah, it was two like, two, it was like two weeks just to rebuild rams. That's another thing that everybody says, too. They're just like, well, it's two rams. I said, yeah, on each cape plane. Yeah. And they're like, what? what? <laughs> you know, yeah, two on each cape plane. Because everybody's used to the cape planes with one. Yeah. You know what I mean? This is two on. And, and, and the rams that Richie put on it, they are as big or bigger than any of the other cape planes I've ever seen with one. Right. They're, they're, they're huge. Right. Um, it, was just, it was just designed right. Well, different thought processes back, back then, then too. as I say, yeah. over-engineer, look at number five drives, look at number yep. three drives, yeah. look at sixes, and now we'll look what we're putting through Bravo drives now. Right. So, I mean, um, the power-wise. Uh, you know, MDC has been invaluable with the, the drive guardians and the drive sync. Oh, yeah, they're unbelievable. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, I don't think we're going to get to run the drive sync this year because I need the way that the boat was set up, everything was set up mechanical. Right. So I don't have those electric indicators on there. Right. Um, so, you know, but he sent it to us. We, we, we have it. Um, I, and, have, um, I have some experience with that. My brother in AMH runs the drive sync. Yeah. And it's also controlling his tunnel tab. Really? Um, yeah. I mean, you can get extremely scientific if you can keep up with them. You know, he's he's very good at what he does. And, and he's a mastermind when right. you talk to him. I mean, and uh, as far as you want to go, he'll push it with you. I mean, he. I mean, my brother's got different. You click this once and it does this, or you click this twice, it does that. Yeah. You know, I. I mean, they were telling me about that when he sent it. He was yeah. like, "Yeah, look, if you ever wanted to do anything else, you just tell me. You send back the box. Yep. And then I'll do whatever to it. Yeah. Um, and then he'll he teach you how to wire me, it. Right. He was yeah. telling me about that. Where like you could, you know, if you click this button, it'll just it'll automatically take them to yeah. whatever. And then, Which in the, in a supercat, I mean, he's got a he's got a million different things going on. Right. And so. That was like a big relief having that off his shoulders because, I mean, you could literally set it. I mean, if it was a little bumpy, you know, you had this set up and that set up. Right. And you could just, it's that easy. I mean, it's just one button. The drives immediately go to where you want them. There's no lag. There's no this. And then they auto level. So, which is another problem, which we don't really come across, right? Like in, in your boat or in our boat, you, you don't, if, if one drive is a hair over the other one, it's not going to make that big of a difference right. in what we do. But when you're running 129, wondering why it's not running 130, right. it's because one's a little higher than the other or the steering wheel's not perfectly straight. I mean, he has steering indicators in that boat. I mean, it's, he, he's done some phenomenal work. Yeah. I mean, that drive sync thing is it, it, it's, unbelievable. It, it, it is. It, it, it really is. And, and you know, the Guardians, you know, I can only go by what everybody has said, right? We don't have much experience with them, but right. uh, from, I don't what I've, from what I've read on them and, and, and what he told me and everything, um, we just, we had to go with them. Right. You, well, you I can I mean? tell you two of my favorite teams run them, and that's Saris and Smith right. Brothers. They both love them. Right. I mean, I, I know there's a million other teams that run them, but those guys, I would take anything they say to the bank, and, and, and with they the love engines, it. And with the engines these guys built for Tsunami, I mean, it, they're... I don't want to get too much into them, but they're 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 ridiculous. I'm a and with the amount of, stuff. with the amount right. of torque that these things are putting, they're basically like diesels. Right. I and mean, with the amount of torque that they're, they're putting out, we had to now. we had to go with the drive. Even right. when I went for when I was doing doing the work, I, I think his name is Mike um, that owns MDC. I think yeah, it is I believe Mike. So. Yeah. 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 Um, when I was when I was talking with him. He says to me, all right, well, I need to set him up. How much torque you guys going to be producing? And I gave him the number. He goes, what? <laughs> that, he says, no, 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 that's wrong. Right. It's not a class four boat. I said, yes, 
and let me check with my brother. And I did. And he goes, nope, you're right. (laughs) And I I called him back and sent him pictures of the dino sheets. And he's like, all right. (laughs) (laughs) We'll set him up. That's why he's like, oh, Um, yeah, I can't wait to be up with Johnny and them. He goes, you're you're running Bravo drives. I'm 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 hoping it stays together, man. Yeah, I mean, we're we're, making some We're running XRs. Well, I can put it to you like this. And I ran that green boat with some pretty monstrous stuff over the years. Um, my initial setup was a 502 making somewhere around a thousand horse. Right. Um, and my, I had never broke a drive on that motor. Never. And you were ever. running XRs on that. XRs. Right? Yeah. yeah. And I was running a Bravo four blade, um, which are notorious for their prop slip, which probably helped me quite a bit. Yeah, and that's what we're running. We're, we're you know for the time being. Well, I mean, we got a bunch of sets of props, but the the ones that we have that I think we're going to end up running. Um, our Bravos and their four blade. Yeah, so. and, and after that, I went to a 572 with a 1071 Wii in on it, which I never dynoed, but I'm sure was better than 1100 horse. Right. And uh, with a mountain of torque behind her, and uh, never broke one on that either. I, well, I that's just, the that's the thing about the about these engines that they built. Um, the the way that it's it don't make much horsepower. Right. I mean, in the grand scheme of things, you know, it it is a decent number. But it isn't a big number. We're right. not talking about thousand horsepower. Right. But it's making a ton yeah. of torque, which is what you want. Yeah, exactly. And a lot of people get so caught up in that horsepower number that they right. forget what pushes the boat. Well, right. that was <laughs> um, that was Jay though. Like I've spent, I'd say hours, but days, if you added up the amount of time talking with Jay. Um, Kyle jokes all the time. He's like, "Listen, man, all all, all this information isn't free. He's right. like, it took years to get this stuff, and I understand that. But Jay has been amazing." Um, at, at, like I'm picking camshafts and going through different things and I'd sit on the phone with him for hours and you know at 10, 11 o'clock at night he's getting off of work from his job and I'm, I'm like dude I, I'm running numbers before I put this thing back on the dyno and I'm sitting there in a simulator like I'm changing these cam numbers I'm putting more boost and I'm doing this and he's like dude he's just like you gotta get originally I was gonna wing these things like 6900 RPM they'll right. go 9000 but right. He's like, you'll burn them up. He's yeah, like, you no won't. Need for he, he goes, no. you won't make it around the track. And if it wasn't right. for him, those days are over. And, yeah. and that's you don't the thing need to do that anymore. No. I, I didn't even, you know, I was thinking completely old school with everything. And Jay's really, you know, brought me back to like, hey, you got to get these things under control. You got to make them live. And, and that's, that's it. He says, he's like, you got to be able to sit there and let them live. So he's like, you got to build it downstairs. Yeah. And then I had to relook everything, you know, redo everything. I actually imagine Nats Motors. Uh, this is what run number three. I, I think I've built oh yeah six uh, it, engines he's, already for that and dyno. He's had six motors. at least five, at least four, four. complete yeah. ready to go in the boat, dynoed, sitting happy. there to like let's bolt them in. And he goes, nope. no, I'm going to rip them back apart. I don't want those heads. I don't I want this head intake. Right. I don't want the you know and and rip them back down and, and then I got rebuilt head, them again. Then I got a head sponsor. Uh, you know, then the last set of heads. The time before this time, uh, I was perfectly content with them and loved them. And, and then um, Steve, you know, uh, turns around from A1 Expert Flooring and he gets a head sponsorship through uh, Flowtech. And he's like, uh, that they're going to give us the heads at you know such a reduced rate, pretty much less than cost. And they, they wanted to run those heads. So um, we built another set of motors. Right. That, right. um, now I'm waiting to dyno those. And right. They'll be dyned yeah, and see what they do. It's funny when you start talking about cams because there's so many different uh, there's so many different opinions. But what I've always found is I, I've I've seen that there's two big curves, right? You have the guys that try to make all the power somewhere around thirty nine to forty four hundred, right. right? Figuring that's where you'll be down low and grunting, that's where you'll want that power. The problem is today's racing doesn't offer any acceleration time. You have one pull. The green flag goes up. You pull to eighty-five, and you're if you're doing it right, you stay there. Yeah, right? and if you if you watch the races, I mean, that Jason and Johnny, they win that race by the second buoy. Right. You, you know what I mean? By time they're around that second buoy, that race is they've already won that race. They're That's so it. far out ahead, and it's I believe it's because of their acceleration. Right. You know what I mean? And then once they get there, they're so dialed in. Like I said, they're machines. They're so dialed in. Nobody can catch them yeah. at that point. Yeah, you know, um, and that was one of the things we were looking at when we we're building the motors was how can how can we get to eighty five as fast as possible and then hold it. Right. You know, and 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 that's where we were. Now the engines that he built for Imagine that. <laughs> They're not 85 mile an hour motors. <laughs> right. That's why he keeps saying you need to go to class two or class three. And I'm like, 
I don't know if I want to be doing 100 miles an hour in an open cockpit. Oh, well, right. and that's it. We, uh, I think, I do believe that um, 105, the so class two is man, it begins the mandatory canopy. Right. Um, class three is fine, um, but uh, anything over 100, pretty much, we look for a canopy. Now. Right. I mean, it's, you know what it is? It's just too easy to get thrown out of one. You know, there's just you can you can look like a. a there's so many people that'll say, well, I would rather get thrown from a boat than be stuck in a canopy. Right. Okay. Until you get thrown from a boat and turn one with 10 other boats. Yeah. Right. You know, so that's when we started kind of, see, we never had that kind of competition before. You'd have your smaller classes, your six, five, and then sometimes four would show up with a big count. And then your big classes where you were really, you know, prone to being thrown out of the boat, there was never more than two or three boats, right? So we never really had this problem until this major shift in like the last 10 years where every single boat that goes out on the course can win, right? Like right. It's, it's, you know, I look back to when I first started, you had two or three boats that I worried about and then five or six that I had to get through, right? Now, every single boat in the lineup can win. Right. And so we had to start taking things a lot more serious. You know, you, you can't let that boat or your boat go run 105 miles an hour if it grabs an edge, mm -hmm. there's no telling what exactly. what could come from that, you know. So that's why we slowed that down. But I, I believe 95 is still fair game, oh, you know. Yeah. And and even if you wanted to stay in four, I mean, there is no horsepower limit. And really, like we said before, anything over that, it, it's 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 about time to start thinking where do we want to go. Right. Right. If we want to stay twin engines, then maybe we want to go into a canopy like you know out of bra out of the bracket classes and into maybe super V. Right or, uh, or uh, extreme, extreme V rather extreme right. V, um, and race like you know with your brother right with the instigator and which whatnot, is you know which I think is going to be a growing class for a long time now yeah because you have a boat with instigator which it doesn't matter what crew you put in it it could be my brother it could be Peter Meyer Stanch Ed Smith doesn't matter who it is that boat is notorious right right. So, like, and I, I don't mean what got it there, but from this point forward, I don't care who you put in it. It's going to be one of the most notorious boats in the pits, right? right? Then you have that LSB, you know, the, the Lily Sport Boats yeah. Fountain, right? Yeah. Britt came out and put a stamp on that boat this year. It doesn't matter what he won or what he lost or what place he came in. He glued the beak of that fountain to the back of Instigator all season long, which isn't easy. No, it, it, it's not. I mean, it, it's just I mean, it isn't easy is an understatement. I mean, it, it, it's so incredibly hard to hang a fountain out that loose, let alone never really did it before. You know what I mean? Right. With you and know, an instigator is is a completely custom boat, right? Well, they cut that down. And that's it and with a boat that's not cut down. Right. From the, to uh, Cooper Standard. They're still around. Um Last I heard, uh, Billy has a Billy Glick has a, uh, a discrepancy in the rule book, which I don't understand because it's not even the same rule book or organization. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, he doesn't want to run it. I, I'm not sure exactly what the full scope is there, but I would assume you'll see him back out. Um, you know, I mean, look if you if you need to know anything about that class, if you're worried about rules, motors, weight tanks, I mean, wh whatever the hell you could possibly be worried about, then explain to me what LSB and Instigator are doing. Right. What are they both cheating in the same way, <laughs> with the same props, with the same, I mean, yeah. maybe they're dead on nuts even. Right. I mean, and, and I know this, I work here with my brother every single day, and every single race in 2019, I asked him, what was that about? Because I, I, I'm a V-bottom guy. Yeah. Cats, cats don't get me going. Yeah, me neither. I'm a V-bottom guy. And if you ask me, the V-bottom is Instigator. Mm -hmm. It's the V-bottom. It is. It, and, and before that was in excess, right? Right. Right? That right. was the boat. Right. You know which one is, is the boat. And so right now, now... The question is, how do we get them to let us pop a mold out of that? Well, well here's that the thing. Be, <laughs> that would be unbelievable. I found the original in excess for sale. No shit. Yeah. Is that the one? That I don't know the, what they want for it. Well, there's but two. The, yeah, there's two. This is the boat number one. No, but one was three engine, one was two engine. Right. They this had different is, lengths. One was like well, 38. I think, was, I think the triple engine was in Geico's shop not too long ago getting turbines put in it. If I remember correctly. I think they had Gary Stray doing the work on that one. Uh, I don't I think I, don't, I saw I a video know. or something on that. Yeah, I believe turbines so. Put in it? I'm not sure how far the project ever went or... or uh, 
you know, if they if it ever got off the ground. But I know it was there. I wonder, and wonder, that was the I intention. If this was the hull and it and that didn't work out. Possibly. Because this is uh, pretty sure that's the trip. No shit. The triple engine. I'm, I'm pretty and sure. The hell of a boat. Yeah. But the hell of a boat. is it? It, it could it sit? Is that hull still capable of competing in rough waters and not coming apart? I mean, you're talking about an old boat. Well, here's the problem with talking about racing instigator at any capacity, right? Is I have never seen a boat that vicious. It's vicious the way it runs. Yeah. I mean, it's I. I have, from day one in my life with boat racing, I have glued myself to Fountain. I, I just, I, ever since I was a little kid, thought they were the coolest boats in the whole wide world, right? Well, I still do. And so I pay attention. And I've seen every competitor come and go. And the Fountain stay. You know, and I think that Instigator is probably Reggie's best production. I think it's, it's, true. it's, 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 it's got to, and, and, and if there's an argument to be made, I think it's Twisted Metal. Mm-hmm. I, I really do. I think Twisted Metal's right there. The work that Billy Glick did with that boat, I mean, they, I, many a times has beaten Instigator. Right. You know, just Instigator has that that uh, that longevity to it where it's been doing this. The you question know? is, too, is on Instigator, how much of that boat is still a fountain? I mean well, that that boat's been blueprinted from the front to the back. They they they, they cut it down. They you know they I chopped think they things took off. The, did they it. chop part of the beak off of it? Yes, yeah. yeah, they chopped yeah, the beak off of it and brought it. Didn't I mean, technically it, slow it down or something? A little bit. It slowed it down, but gave it more control because yeah. of bow lift or something. Yeah, yeah. It, well, in in high speeds, mm-hmm. um, which back then I believe they were running thirteen hundred horse. You know, through them at some point, they were five. It was a spec class. Seven hundred and fifty horse aside, I believe says fifteen hundred horse total. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, this is going back a little ways. See, now they have a pretty simple set of rules. Back then, they actually were running blower motors. Oh. Okay. And uh, which Lily Sport Boats was Cintron at the time right. was all silver had those blower motors in it, and uh, we went. Well, we weren't supposed to. But we went for a ride with it here in the river back when it was. Um, you know, Herbie was building the motors from Stotler. Uh, performance engines and uh and it was west wyatt's boat and uh we went down the river with that at well over 140 miles an hour and it's a handful because that beat gets in the wind it's like you ever drive an old corvette yep. yeah i own one all right so you get up around 115 120 and you lose all the vacuum in the motor and those headlights open <laughs> and it's a handful to drive right yeah. it's exactly that i mean it gets out and it gets that beak up in the air and it, it, it just it starts it starts floating yeah, yeah i mean i don't think i don't too. think instigator really has that you know i think instigator's a a pretty well balanced ready to rock and roll well, they, machine because they cut it all out yeah but so is twisted metal i mean they were doing oh, that yeah, to a lot of them did. at the time yeah that, that it is a fountain build that fountain did that to those boats right. um there were a lot of them over the years um but a lot of them went overseas which is right. the unfortunate part is now how do you get them back? I mean, it's, you know, the logistics of that is ridiculous. It, but, true, true. Um, but it is possible, and there's guys doing it. I think there's actually two new teams coming for that class this year, um, which is awesome. I think it's going to grow. I mean, it, you're, you're dealing with homegrown engines, right? You have a rule book to follow. You can build them. Right. right? You don't have to go through Mercury or go through any of our ridiculous dyno rules or anything like that, right? I mean, it's a pretty simple build process. You know, you have to pass tech inspection at the sites. And, and, I mean, how hard is it to find a 42 fountain or something in that range? I mean, in outer limits or how hard is it to find, you know, with the cat craze and the center console craze. And the, those boats seem to have come down significantly in value. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, it seems that they have. It's well, possible. What we need to get is uh, someone needs to call Reggie out and have him build a uh, 30 or a 32 foot uh, V light boat. Uh, and he did. He did? He did, yes. Really? Oh. Yeah, um, at the time, I believe it was called uh, Watch Your Back. It was huh. Doc Jansen's boat. Um, it was a 30-foot fountain. I believe it was the only one built. I could be wrong about that. I'm sure somebody will correct me if I am. Um, and then there was a plug pulled off it, and uh, I believe that is now the Raven boat, hmm. um, which is originally a fountain design, if I'm, if I'm on, on, the num- on the money with this. And there's another one called Absolutely Not. Is a, is another yeah, fountain pole. I know that boat. Yep, that's another fountain pole. It so is. he did make a stab at it. I think that was right at the end of Reggie's kind of carte blanche run at, at that factory, which is a shame. They really should just, I mean, just let him run it. The guy, yeah. the guy knows what he's doing. Right. Man. And uh, I did just recently see that Reggie the third is out of the fountain plant now, and looking to maybe do his own thing. So maybe we might just get our wish with a forty-two yeah. or a forty-seven being built today. 
Which would that be would fantastic. Be, it would be nice to start seeing some of these boat builders again building boats that are just strictly built for racing. Yeah. You know, I had like I had that conversation with Richie Jr. You know, he told me straight out, he goes, Look, if you would have asked me back then if I thought that any of these boats would still be running, you would think it was crazy. Yeah. You know, he said that the, those boats were built, most of them. We built them, he said, to beat the crap out of them for a couple seasons and throw them away. And right. they're still out there running bracket classes That's and stuff That's what uh, with them. John told me from Superboat. Yeah. I called him and he goes... And he, I, I was on the phone with him when I was building my boat, you know, going through different things. And great another, brain to pick. Another yeah. great guy. I, I didn't even know that he was, you know, the owner of Superboat. Right. But Both guy, of the Coens he, are just he, money. He picks up the phone, and I'm talking to him for hours on end, day in and day. He's like, oh, I remember when I built that boat. And he's like, I put a screen in the fuel tank, and I'm thinking... How old is this guy, man? I got a 1977 Superboat, and I'm talking to him on the phone. But he even said, he's like, dude, when, when we built these boats, he goes, I thought they'd be throwaways. He, he's like, yeah. we built them light and well, thin. And and you know what I think it, it really boiled down to was I don't think they had any real confidence in their materials, right? I mean, at the time, it was pretty that's true. Pretty run of the mill. I mean, it, I mean, it was plywood and, yeah. and hair, you know? I mean, they yeah. were just gluing shit together and they were putting enough wood in them that they thought they were pretty sturdy, you right. know? So if well, you, they if, were right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you look at what they were doing, I mean, you, you mentioned it earlier that they were over-engineering. I mean, they, they over-engineered everything because they had no idea of, you know, when, when I say something today like composites, right? When I say like, a, you know, different composites and different, that can mean a million things. There's right. people building boats out of, out of just carbon fiber. There's people, but if you would have said that to somebody from 50 years ago, they'd have been like, you're doing what? Right. You're building a boat out of this bendy shit yeah. and you're going to fill it with a quarter inch of foam and that's going to be a super stock. Right. You know what I mean? They'd be like, what the fuck? That's not possible. Right. But if you look at what they built back then, they built shit that would last. Yeah. They didn't know they were doing that. No, they didn't. But, but they but, did. But it is. It, it, and, and, and they're lasting. And, but at a certain point, like you said, a lot of stuff went overseas. I mean, even look at the, look at the, um, uh, the banana boat. Jeff DeJohn. Jeff, Jeff, yeah. Jeff De, De, DeJohn. DeJohn. Yeah. However you say it. I that, think you nailed it. He bought that. And now he's retrofitting it for outboards and stuff like that over right. in Thailand. Right. You know what I mean? So that boat's gone. Right. It's not coming back. And that was an all-out race boat. That yep. was a badass race boat. Oh, yeah. Um, so where, where are these boats going to come from? Somebody's got to start yeah. popping them. Yeah. I think it'll you happen. Know? And I think, I think Brett's got a good start. Oh, yeah. I Brit. really think Brett's got a good start. Yeah, Brett. Uh, Brett's, um, he's, a, he's a special dude in this sport right now. He's... One of the one of the people that realized he had an opportunity and just feet first dove yeah. in. I mean, I mean, just I, I wish him the best. The 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 first of all, the boats that he's building now are tested and and ready to rock and roll. I mean, those extremes are as awesome as a Phantom. Right. Right. I mean, they're they're basically the same thing. You know what I mean? Just a little different deck style. So he has confidence in the product at the moment right i mean you know what it is you know how it runs you know what it's going to be right, right. and then you have a guy like brit who's willing to do the work right i mean there's nobody that works harder than that kid no and that's so, what you got to do right you yeah know what i mean it, it, what, any so, of these things it comes down to you got to put in the work yeah and i i hope it works all i hope it works out for him because it, it could be a great example to the rest of the people in the sport or around this sport that you can do this successfully, yeah. and, we, and we need it really bad. I, I touched on needing like purpose-built class seven boats, right? Like, how easy is 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 that? It's not, you know. I mean, you look at go find a mold and start trying to do it, and then still turn a profit, right? Right. I mean, it, it's almost impossible, even a at lot, that level. A lot of it, like you said, I think what we need is more like what Reggie was doing. Is that you got to be doing R and D, building race boats, and the old adage of you know what what races on sunday sells on monday um where you're building a race boat in a race hull and then you turn around and you turn it into a pleasure boat and then say listen this thing is out there running 140 miles an hour in a v-bottom and then say hey now we can put you in this and it'll run 120 right. or 130 all day long with a cabin in it. Right. But I, I think a little bit of that is going away because ever, with the, the outboard cats, yeah. um, you might have something there, right. you know, with, with Doug and other people building something if they're going to really start producing 
canopied race boats more than a couple here or there. Right. But it's big money to get into them. It's yeah, hard to argue an outboard, though, too. Yeah. I mean, yeah. these outboards that Merck are putting out. Yeah. 70 grand and, and you can pin on that. Un- unbelievable. And yeah. they'll run forever. They'll run forever. Well, and I, I'm, not a, I'm not an outboard guy. Me neither. At all. Never been. But you, know, but I, you got it. You got to look at what they're producing. Yeah. And, and it's still, it's amazing. Yeah, I mean, they, they, they convinced me. Yeah. You know, it's, it's just, it, where else can you buy something that's going to put out whatever to not even pick a motor just any any of mercury's new line of anything right Mm -hmm, right. you can go out and kick the shit out of it as hard as you want for as long as you want and if you break it it's probably still under warranty right but where else are you going to get something that i'll just pick a number we'll just say 70 grand 80 grand that's the motor the drive the rigging everything everything and any person with any kind of mechanical ability takes out four six bolts and bolts it to the back of their boat and right. goes, plugs in two plugs and goes done. And yeah. I just built, uh, I just bolted up 900 horsepower to the back of my boat. And, and the 400s go come right. with a ridiculous warranty. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? Like it's everything ready to go and it comes with a ridiculous warranty right. that can go forever. Yeah. I um, mean, Mercury's, I mean, they, yeah, I, I, I felt horrible when I saw like Evan Rude was going under and, you know, yeah. but if you look at, the you know the the real nuts and bolts of that whole scenario it's because of the work that mercury's doing right and you can't you can't knock that you can't like i've heard people oh well mercury's monopolizing everything no mercury's just working harder than That's everybody it. else right. you know and you can't take that away from them right. i mean they're look i mean everything find somebody who does everything great it's almost impossible it's true. look at mercury you want a good set of propellers? Call Mercury. You want a good inboard? Call Mercury. You want a good outboard? Call Mercury. You want the best drives? Call Mercury. I mean, it's it, they're not monopolizing everything. They're just the best at everything. Yeah, they, they and most good, of they're doing their, a good job. And most of their products um, weren't their original designs either. They actually made them better. Like um, your Bravo drives weren't Bravos. I believe they were Volvo Pentas. The cone clutch setup, they only were able to get it back in when the Bravo came out. Was it? 88, 89, I believe, somewhere in there, 87. You know, that's when the patents ran out from Volvo, and then Mercury was able to take it and make it that much it's better. That R&D, right. though. It's but that's that R&D. Also, yeah. They spend so much money on R&D. Yeah. You know, I, they, they, they put these motors out, like, like the 525s. They put these motors out that it doesn't matter if they send that thing to Alaska or they send it to Florida. You, you, you bolt it up, you put it in the boat, and it's going to run fine. The computer's right. going to be fine. There's there's no running too rich, running too lean. It, it's all self-adjusting. It, yeah. If you're lazy thing? or a little broke that weekend and you use 87, it compensates. Right. When you put 93 in it, it compensates. Right. I mean, it's, it, it is. It's, it's mm-hmm. absolutely amazing. And uh, I, I know that Mercury doesn't need any more touting or pat on the back. I mean, everybody knows. Right. But it's just, it's, it's crazy to me, having come from this. I mean, so understanding... You know, coming from engine builders, right? I mean, right. it's what my brother does. You know, he's one of the best I know. And, and uh, to watch, like, like if I said to Aunt, Aunt, could you build me a big block for your little brother, right? So do it right. And could you guarantee me three years? No. Fuck no. no. Yeah. You know what? Mercury can. Right. At yeah. an insane, alarming rate. They're pumping these things out like it's no big deal. I mean, it's, I, I'm 1,650 horsepower, 1,350. When, and when I did mean, that become normal? Yeah. Right? right? Like, when did that become, like, to say 1,650 was, if anybody, when I was... Even eight years ago. Maybe yeah, eight, fuck, eight, ten fuck years before I, I was, yeah, fuck when I was I, young. Not even that long ago. Go five, six years ago and right. say I have 1,600 horse motors in my boat. People right. will be like, yeah, right. Two of them or one of yeah, them? Yeah, even, yeah, even, right. even forget about that. What about quad rotors? Yeah. I mean, it's just, I mean people, people had enough problems trying to put, they put a blower on a motor boat, and, 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 on a boat motor, and it's like, it was all kinds of problems, you know, right. when Whipple first started coming out. Now, Mercury says, all right, we'll throw two on there and we'll give you a warranty with it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's it, it's insane, and on top of that, I mean, you, you're you're looking at like when I was when I was old enough to understand what was going on, right? And I looked at you know like Dave Scott's boats, or and they opened the hatch, and there's you know the 1550 Sterling, right? That was the holy grail. If yeah. you had the Sterlings, yeah. you had the 1550s, you had the bad motherfucker, right? Well, now 
every single guy with a with an MTI, a skater, a, 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 anything under the sun has mercury power in it, yep. and it comes with the option of 1650, 1750, mm -hmm. 1550. What do you want? You want the 1350, and then in a year when you get bored, we'll sell you a computer and make it a 1550. Yeah. I mean, who started just making 1500 horse interchangeable? Right. Who started? Mercury. <laughs> like, it was no big deal. Like, it, it, uh, I just, I, I'm mind blown. I, I, I am. I, I sit with Stuart Haley from time to time, who's, I, I believe he's the GM of Mercury High Performance. And uh, I, I just listened to him speak about certain things. You know, like he, he's an outboard guy, right? So he talks about his outboards. And I ask him some questions. Like, I asked him about the 565, and he's, he'll tell you. Like, I, I don't really know much about that, you know, which is cool. And he'll start talking to me about outboards. And I have no idea what he's talking about. And I don't have the heart to tell him that. Right. <laughs> right? So I'll just sit there and listen. I don't know the first thing about an outboard. Right? And I'll listen to him. But what I take away from it is this dude loves it. Like, loves it. Like, pours his heart into his outboard project. Yep. And Mercury has a team of these rocket scientists that love building their shit. You know, they have these unbelievable playhouses. I mean, they're, they're the money that Mercury pours into their... You know their development yeah, the side R &D of it is ridiculous, is unbelievable, and so that's you, why they have what they have. Yeah, I mean, because it's awesome. of the amount of money that they pour into that, yeah, it's, I, it's, it's unbelievable. And the, and the thing that that is really important about the conversation is with Mercury putting out motors like that. Think about our future. Think about the future of racing. When right, right now, someone saying like you, fifteen hundred horsepower, that's no big deal. Right. We'll put out 1,500 horsepower and give you a three-year warranty. Right. What's coming? Right. And what's that going to do to racing? What's that going to do to the instigators and the boats like that? Right. Where you can, and the Miss Geico's and whatnot, well, where you can go just throw 218, uh, was it 18? 1650. 16, 16, 16, I think that's the biggest one, right? 16, 16, 17, 50. 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17. Which now, it's, it's not, I don't think they publicize it too much, but the 1750, you can buy a turn-up kit, which makes them like 2,200. Oh. They're 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 Which, quad yeah. rotor. Can I, can I, deal, right? can I get two no of them? Deal. Yeah, and we'll work it for into class, your payment for class right. four. We'll work it into your payment every month too for that brand <laughs> right. new boat. It's insane. Right? It's absolutely insane. I'll man. pay that off five lifetimes from now. <laughs> That's it, man. You do take going, IOUs. Going fast costs money. Going but and you're 100 percent right. What could that do to the landscape of racing? Right. Right. And, and that's why I do, I, I, I don't, I'm not doing this on purpose. I just genuinely am fascinated with Mercury's work. But I do hope that at some point they put, they give some back. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, what is Mercury racing without racing? Well, and that's the other thing, right? Mercury, the one thing that they've been failing on a little bit is, look, we're not, nobody's asking for anything for free. I am. But if they can't, well, okay. <laughs> but if they come down and say, hey, look, you know, if you guys can come up with a 50 motor deal or something like that, you know, we'll produce this for you and we'll give you, you know, we'll give it to you at cost or, or a little right. over cost or something like that. Um, well, if you ask but, them, they're losing money every time they sell a motor. Well, that's true too. But I mean, you ever buy, go into a new boat dealer and try to buy even a car? I mean, you know, they're paying you to take the vehicle out of there. Yep. But that Mercury, I, I think, kind of needs to do. Something. something there, yeah. You know, well, it, and but I, none of those big sponsorships are around anymore. No. You know, the, the back in the days of the the nineties and, and the eighties, where people were pulling big sponsors. I mean, I remember when Artie first started. One of his sponsors was Kendall Motor Oil. Try right. to get a sponsor like that today for like yeah. a B class or, or a luck. class four boat. It's not happening. Yeah, you can't even ask. I mean, it, they won't even hear you out. Right. It's crazy. But with Mercury, I have been enjoying seeing their slow entrance back to the sport here. And maybe yeah. it's maybe it's just me. I mean, coming from an OPA background where Mercury was primarily one of Carbonell's sponsors in SBI. Um, but uh, to see, like, I saw the Mercury truck for the first time in, like, 10 years last year, which to me was, like, a cool thing when I was young. When you pulled in the pits and the Mercury truck was sitting there and, you know, you broke you broke your drive, you went over to the Mercury truck, they rolled one out for you all right. nice and brand new. It was awesome. You know, it really was cool. And the fans got to see a lot of cool stuff. They'd have a motor out there running or something. And, you know, it was neat. So it's nice to see, like, them slowly coming back. They're handling the tech inspection for Class 1. Oh, that's good. So, yeah, they, they help out with that, which is really good. I mean, it, listen, anything we can get right now is fantastic. Absolutely. So it's been great having them at least involved. I mean, just having them around has been awesome. You know, I hope they do take a bigger bite. We could really, really use it, you know. Right, but, right. But uh, it is what it is, man. But um, 
anyway, guys, that's a uh, that's a couple hours. Mm-hmm. Good deal. You want to wrap up? Do, yeah. You got any any uh, quick sponsors you want? Uh, yeah, to I mean, real quick? I, uh, yeah, we got um. So KD Aviation did some paint work on the boat. We're we're, we're extremely grateful for that because otherwise we would have had to do it. Um, of course, you know, Cutting Edge Aviation, which is my company, and I can't tell you how much money I've dumped in. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, real quick, I just say, you know, Prop Talk Magazine, great. Great magazine off the Chesapeake Bay boating. Great people. Um, yeah, they they uh, they're in the uh, July issue here for 2020. They did a, a two page um, thing on on both boats, um, an article with uh, you know some of what some of the background story like we went through and then uh, what we've done to the boats and, and stuff like that. Great great bunch of people. So they are yeah. and they do they cover a lot of racing for us as well. So if you don't. If you don't have any sentimental attachment to that, you're more than welcome to put it on my my sponsor prop here. Okay, they uh, they are they're great people. Everybody should give them a shout. Yeah, yeah, they, they're they're great. Um, that's about it. That's Covered about everybody. It. I mean, uh, you got um, a one expert flooring. They do um, all kinds of hardwood flooring installations, refinishing. Um, wouldn't be a finishing without shouting out to uh, Joe Palio with Zap Fitness. I, I know a lot of gyms are closed right now, and you know a lot of them are struggling to uh, get through this but um joe's been great um a great friend and uh, yeah he actually um when we thought we weren't going to be able to race because of covid and um lifeline and i don't know if i mentioned lifeline but big shout out to lifeline as well for helping us out with that but um we didn't think we were going to be able to get vests right and uh and joe actually was like i got a couple of vests you can have them Right, and he gave them to us. Awesome. So yeah, big big shout out to yeah, him. Yeah, they're great too. people. They sponsor the organization as well. Anybody who needs life jackets, call Lifeline, man. Right, they're the best. Yeah. So, but, uh, um, all right, man. That's yeah. it. Yeah, that's, that's everything. It. Cool, yeah. man. Thanks so, for having us. Yeah, man. thank it's you guys great. so much for coming in. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Awesome.